Out of the gates and ready to go. Monday edition for Outkick 360 across the Outkick Network. Glad you're with us. With Chad Withrow, I'm Jonathan Hutton. Dan Donkich will be with us. He joins us in about 20 minutes from Outkick's Don't At Me with Dan Donkich. Each Monday, we'll chat the biggest storylines with Dan. Looking forward to that. Plus, the NFL Combine begins tomorrow officially, and we'll have Chris Trapasso from CBS Sports. He'll be with us in hour number two. We'll go through the big headlines to preview what's to come. Quarterbacks that will be throwing, that will not be throwing. Who's going to look great based on the underwear Olympics, as they like to call it. Chad, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Hutton. Ready for a big week? Yeah. Well, you got, what, Bears, who are likely to trade the number one overall pick. MLB salary cap has a big discrepancy, or no cap, I should say. TV distribution, that's an issue for them as well. We'll discuss that later in today's show. Plus, uh, Daniel Snyder, something we threw out as a possibility a month ago, blocking Jeff Bezos uh, reportedly from putting an offer in on the commanders. But I know we're going to talk more about this, but it seems to me that from the perspective of a business person, to block out the person with more money than anyone else in the world from possibly purchasing something you own is a bit counterintuitive from just a strictly business perspective. But hey, you know, I've never had a grudge that I've held that, that hard. So if you do, you do, and then you do whatever you want. When you've got you-know-what uh, type of money, if you're Daniel Snyder or anyone else. We start, though, where we left off on Friday, and that's in Tuscaloosa, where Brandon Miller took the floor and, of course, did his thing for Alabama as they were hosting Arkansas, his first home game since everything went down, and received a, a big ovation from the Crimson Tide faithful, as one would expect. And, Chad, the, no surprise on that end, but... The starting lineup, quote-unquote, routine, and we'll hear from Nate Oates in a moment, where Brandon Miller, who, again, brought the gun to the scene, where two of his friends are now facing capital murder charges in an event that took place on January 15th. News came out last week in the preliminary hearing that's now in front of a grand jury that Miller received a text from Darius Miles, now former teammate of Miller, to bring the gun back to the scene, which was then used in this uh, killing of uh, Kamia Harris. Chad, he goes through the starting lineup announcement and then has a pat down as if it's a, you know, a, a frisking of sorts. Now, some are trying to say that this is like the UFC pat down. No, this is, this is something that is uh, spitting in the face of the victim and overlooking what is a very serious issue, not that he's playing, but that they're not viewing this uh, in, in the right way. And, and, and the right way would be with some sympathy, with some empathy. I've seen nothing of that. Alabama told us last week they were going to play him regardless. Even if Greg Byrne, the AD, was saying he didn't learn about the text message specifically until that hearing, well, they were going to play him anyway because he played after Greg Byrne, the AD, learned of this news. It's unclear when Nate Oates found out about that. But they're dug in on playing him. And this continues to happen where we don't know. Who knows the news cycle, Chad, of how long this actually goes on. But the more and more that the cameras are rolling and he's on the court or doing something or Nate Oates has a microphone in front of him, the more and more this story continues, and it's sad. It's sad. It's, it's uh, alarming that we haven't seen more done in terms of the discipline end of it. Maybe there's been something behind the scenes. There's no indication that that has happened. And in regards to how he took the floor this past weekend, this past Saturday, here's Nate Oates' response as he started his presser. Before I get started on the game, it... it was brought to my attention after the game about our pregame introductions. I think that's something that's been going on all year. I don't really know. I'm not, I don't watch our introductions. I'm not involved with them. I'm trying to plays during that time. Regardless, it's not appropriate. It's been addressed and I can assure you it definitely will not happen again the remainder of this year. So. And of course, Miller's headed to the draft after this season. Ridiculous. That the, the fact that he's acting like he doesn't know what goes on the same way he's saying he doesn't know what he has control of whenever they're not on the practice court and they're headed out on a, you know, a weekend night. 
Look, fans are fans. You know, I've I've heard from a lot of them. I'm sure you have, Hutton. Outkick yep. has heard from a lot of Alabama fans. Uh, a lot of them put creative things on, you know, hard hats over the weekend about Outkick founder Clay Travis. So these things happen. None of it is particularly surprising with fans and their defense of, of, of players or coaches. But I just have a hard time watching what happened on Saturday and watching Nate Oates' response to it and just watching that clip that we just played for you right there and thinking that anyone that's not a diehard Alabama fan is actually supporting this team and this coach. I, I, I think they're not. I mean, I, this is whoever plays Alabama in the NCAA tournament is America's team. It is that simple. People rooted against Kentucky when they were going for an undefeated season, and they didn't have anybody on that team that you know murdered someone that was taken off the team, and then someone else who brought the murder weapon to someone that was playing, continuing to play as the best player on the team. And people root against them because they were Kentucky and they were undefeated. And when Wisconsin beat them in the Final Four, that was a big night for America. If Alabama loses in this tournament, it's a big night for America. Um, there's no justice for a, the murder victim and her family. I'm not trying to equate basketball to that. But this is more about a lack of discipline and accountability within a program and a completely unlikable man and coach in Nate Oates and how he's handled this. Look, if Nate Oates kicked Brandon Miller off the team when finding out about this or even suspended him for a month or eight games or whatever you want to say the suspension just, should just have been. took action. Took action in some way. I think I and a lot of other people come back and say, man, this is just a really tough situation. Boy, that really sucks for the victim first and foremost, but this is a crazy situation for Alabama, and Nate Oates did what he absolutely had to do in this case. He's done none of that. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, Hutton, he has completely reconstructed what we believe coaches have to do well, it's, in it's, a situation. This is a no-brainer. It's Anyone attached to that, anyone like, there that night, anyone around the guys who committed this horrific crime, they're done with your program. Well... And then Brandon Miller, who does this during warm-ups, then proceeds to put it as his Twitter banner on social media, which has since been deleted, uh, taken down, uh, and the story is at OutKick in, in regards to that with uh, a great job by Hookstead on this. But the, it's embarrassing for anyone with a conscience that you have your coach, every time he opens the, the microphone, is speaking on this, but not really saying anything. Other than, yeah, we're, we're doing what we're doing because we want to do it. We're going to continue to do it regardless of what people think about how this went down. Even though we now know, and it's an undeniable fact, because there's not a single side of this story that says he didn't supply the weapon by driving it back to the scene at the request of Darius, uh, Darius Miles. That, and, and based on the quotes from the text, there's no debate about what was insinuated that was in the car. So he knew, even if he didn't know it was in the car at the time, he knew based on that text that it was. And no one's denying that, including Miller's attorney. But yet we have this going into the game where he's being patted down. And then post game, he's putting this as his banner and on a freeze frame of being patted down during the warmups with his name up on the jumbotron as everyone cheers. It is embarrassing, not just for Alabama, for the SEC, for college basketball, that this continues to go on without anyone taking accountability for why or why not they decided to go about this the way they did. There's no detail to it because Oates and Byrne don't give us any detail as to their line of thinking or what's going on behind the scenes from what they've been told. And it's more than just charges haven't been brought because that's not going to happen. This is more than that based on the way this went down, the facts that have been out since the hearing took place, and whether or not they knew about it on January 15th, I think they probably did. Um, and they've gone about it the, the, this way and so nonchalant, you know, uh, not even mentioning the victim until realizing that they haven't. It, it, it's alarming. That, that's, it's sad and how they've handled this. It's sad. It's, it's pathetic. It's a just an, not just an awful look. This is not just about optics. It really does just, to me, cast a shadow over the entire Alabama athletic department. And this is a very proud and strong athletic department. I mean, look at their basketball program right now. 
They're probably going to be the number one overall seed in the NCAA tournament. Football program, very strong. They win a lot of games. But rational people are going to have a hard time separating that from what's going on right now. And, and, and really forever with Nate Oates because of how poorly he's handled this. Greg Byrne has handled this poorly as Alabama's athletic director. No one is showing any leadership. And I am sick and tired of Jay Billis going on TV and whatever a student athlete does, he takes the side of that athlete. It is tired. It is old. Jay Billis knows basketball. Jay Billis, I think, was a lawyer at one point or went to law school. So he feels like he's the little guy's defender and he's got to go up on the student athlete on every single cause. And him talking about Brandon Miller having rights. No one is denying that Brandon Miller has rights as a citizen and with the legal system. It's why he's a cooperating witness right now and he's not being charged with anything. If the police really wanted to dig on his knowledge of what was in his car the whole night, they probably could dig up enough knowledge to eventually charge him with something. They're not because they're trying to get the two murderers convicted. I understand that. That's good police work. He shouldn't be charged anything for that reason because he's going to roll over on the two guys who committed the murder. And he's probably going to testify to that. And they've even said, his attorney said he's been cooperative the entire time. Those rights are different than the quote-unquote right you have as a student athlete representing a university and playing a sport at the highest level of college athletics. How can Alabama fans or anyone not get this through their thick skulls? It is very simple to understand. Just because you say Brandon Miller should be off the team doesn't mean you're saying Brandon Miller should go to prison. Right. There should be action from the school, from the program with him, separate of whatever the legal system does. And Jay Billis going on talking about he has rights. Come on. Well, but he also, Billis yes, also he has insinuated rights as that, someone with a lawyer. that this would, this, they would have handled this the same way as any other student athlete. And that is just not true. No, and it's not in Hutton. You brought up a good point before the show today and we were talking about this. It's not just that he's the maybe the best player in America is why he's getting preferential treatment. If Alabama was an eight or a nine seed. Right. And they were disappointing at all this year. He's probably kicked off the team. Yes. And or you know suspended what, at, at You know what at Alabama minimum. fans are saying? If that was the case, good riddance. Yeah. You good want to riddance. Wipe, Get rid of this. You anyone need to wash that your hands a, of it. Yes. Anyone that had a, a, a part to do in this stain on our program and our athletic department with this murder, get them out of here. They would be arguing that if Brandon Miller was not leading Alabama to a number one overall seed and scoring 41 points to beat a team in overtime. And, and, That's the only well, reason they're defending him. And meanwhile, doing the pat-down during warm-ups for the first home game back. You can't defend that. That's you awful. cannot. You cannot defend that. I'm so, I don't care if this has happened all year. The fact that it happened after January 15th, and not one person on that team is smart enough to think, you know, guys, maybe we should cool it with a pat down. You know, once now that all this stuff is out, you know, maybe we shouldn't be doing this before a game, even if it's not always televised and there's not cameras on us. You cannot convince me that every player on that team and that Brandon Miller and the kid that's doing that to him is that stupid. Well, they're and, not that stupid. And then posting it as the banner on they your social media. They know what they're doing. They, yes. And then deleting that account. They, they, they know what they're doing. You're, you're exactly right. And meanwhile, Chad, the, the SID wants basketball questions only. Game only questions for Nate Oates. I, I mean, Really? You well, really expect the questions to just stick to the game based on what we've seen now? This is the, Absolutely not. This is the Alabama way. It's not just Alabama, but Alabama is majors in this when it comes to censorship of their own media that covers the team and what the media is willing to report on and what they're willing to say because they're probably threatened access at all times by that athletic department. But, yeah, to come on and say, you know, only questions about the game, it's, it's not going to end anytime. You know what? It's going to get no. worse and worse for them. In if the they tournament. keep winning. Yeah, in the tournament with the national media. I just keep thinking about, look, this team on the court is good enough to win a national title. And how awkward it's going to be if on yeah. championship Monday night, this Alabama team and Brandon Miller has got the championship hat on and is cutting down a net. And I keep thinking about just how awful that's going to feel, thinking about the victim's family watching that. And the rest of America that's not an Alabama fan that doesn't have crimson-colored glasses on 
how awkward they're going to feel watching this run that's going to be led by Brandon Miller, a guy who transported a murder vehicle to a murder. This is, a, this is an incontrovertible fact. This is not spin. This is nothing else. Even if you believe everything that his attorney said, it's still an incontrovertible fact. The attorney's not arguing that he did not deliver the murder weapon to the scene of a murder. So let's get that straight before continuing to talk about this. It's disgusting. And the, the back and forth with the text are available through this hearing. And there's a video as well of who was involved and who wasn't and who drove the car and who didn't in, in, in this respect. And again, Chad, you're right. No one's disputing the fact of who brought the weapon back and who knew the weapon was in the car that he was driving back to that bar on the strip in Tuscaloosa. I, I would say that the fact that the defense attorney is, is not in that statement saying, you know, he never saw the text and, you know, definitely didn't have any knowledge of the gun in the car. I would probably take that as, yeah, he knew that it was in the back seat yeah, of the car. Well, yeah, and in, in fact, it goes on to say they just he didn't know the intent of why Miles wanted his gun. Yeah, and as, as someone, you know, uh, with a reasonable brain, I'll also say that even if the defense attorney claimed he had no knowledge of yeah. a gun underneath some clothes in the back seat, in the seat of the car, and that he got a text saying, bring me my joint back, I would probably say, well, that's defense attorney speak. And he probably knew it was there. So let's just keep that in mind as well. Coming up, Chad's take on the Pac-12 and how they are in a world of hurt uh, right now with their TV rights contract. We'll discuss that for Major League Baseball as well. But when we return, Dan Dockett recaps the big headlines from the college basketball weekend. We start with Alabama, and we'll get into more. Dan's next on Outkick 360. Hey, guys, let's move on to probably the thing more people are talking about, unfortunately, uh, for baseball than anything, which are the new rule changes. Uh, I'm going to start off by saying I think they all suck uh, and are horrible. Uh, so uh, I'm coming from that angle. Um, and, and I know that, again, sounds like the... Uh, old man get off my lawn theory but the game uh baseball was the only game uh, really the only game without a, a clock the only game left without a clock and now that 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 is changing i'm, I'm not happy about that but we'll talk about uh start off with the, the kind of the inconsequential ones a bigger base you know here's the only complaint i have about that a hun over 100 years ago when baseball was invented uh it was mathematically perfect the diamond was mathematically perfect 90 feet between bases 60 feet, 6 inches from the mound to the plate, and I think 135 feet from home plate to second base. All of those things created the statistical uh, uh, hall of fames that we have. Um, you take 6 inches away from the mound, you're going to have drastically different batting averages and career batting averages. You change the, the, the base paths, uh, shorten or lengthen, you're going to have a dramatic impact. Uh, the base being a little bit bigger... <laughs> I don't think is going to do absolutely anything for player safety. I think it's just going to look stupid. Uh, it'll give advertisers a bigger face uh, on the bases, which you know is going to happen. Um, if they wanted to truly take care of player safety, they, they would have done what softball did and put an alternate bag on the outside of the baseline and have the runner run to that instead of running to the same bag. So I, I think that's kind of a dumb one, and I don't think it's going to have much to do. Um, the pitch clock. Uh, so as a pitcher, I can tell you this, the only pitchers in professional baseball that will be affected by the pitch clock are pitchers that suck period. It, it, it's 20 seconds. I think between, uh, return of the ball and the next pitch with nobody on, I think it's 30 seconds with runners on or whatever that should never, ever come into play. A good pitcher gets rid of the ball, in my opinion, uh, 8 to 10 to 12 seconds after he gets it back. There's no – and the only thing that delays that is the batter stepping out of the box, which can no longer happen, which is, you're going to see some guys are going to have a lot of problems with that. You watch spring training, if nothing else, for that. Um, but the pitch clock is not going to be something that's going to impact anybody that's any good because uh, good pitcher – well, I mean, one of the etiquettes of being a good pitcher is you get the ball back and you, and you throw because you keep your defense on their toes – uh, you keep everybody in the game. And when you're in the dog days of summer and you're out, uh, used to be uh, not as much anymore, but I, I can remember being on uh, St. Louis's artificial turf and it was 165 degrees uh, for the everyday players. 
and getting your your team off the field quickly on a hot summer day is a good thing. Plus, again, you're going to find that pitchers that work faster will give up fewer unearned runs and will have better defensive metrics behind them uh, as a whole. Um, so the pitch clock, eh, whatever. Um, the runner at second base is stupid now as it was then. Just stupid, stupid, stupid. Uh, don't get it. Don't understand. I know what they're trying to do, but I just think it's dumb and it takes away. Uh, plus, it's also going to change statistics. You're going to get an RBI. Pitcher's not going to have to give up an earned run. Follow us on social and find the podcast anywhere you download your audio. Just search out Outkick 360. Sixth and Peabody are location with Eha Beer and Old Smoky Moonshine. Hutton and Withrow with you. Joined by Dan Dockich, host of Don't At Me, Outkick Network, mornings, 9 a.m. Eastern. Dan, good to see you. Thank you for the time as always. And let's start here. What did, what did you think? How would you have described Nate Oates, the coach, prior to early last week when we learned the details of this case and everything that happened after that with Brandon Miller to how you feel on this Monday? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I thought Oates, and I still think Oates, a terrific basketball coach. I've always thought uh, there was a little bit of a punk side to him. Last year he did this handshake thing and I put out, what are you doing? I mean, at Calvin Sampson, the game was over, was going nuts on the official and he acted like a little punk. So I, I put that out, but uh, I've always thought he's a good coach, always thought he's a good recruiter. Didn't really, don't really know him. Know a lot of people that do know him and they all speak highly of him. But now I, I you know, I have no respect for the guy. I, I, spent my career doing the right thing, whether it was leaving West Virginia and 3.5 million or standing up to a bunch of idiots in Indiana. Um, and I just don't respect uh, coaches that are gutless. I don't respect coaches uh, that don't have any sack. I, I just don't. And, and I'm wrong. I'm sure. I'm sure I'm wrong. I'm sure I'm old. I'm sure I'm yelling at the clouds. But <laughs> a lot of us in college basketball over the years sacrificed a lot not to cheat. And we knew who was cheating. We knew a little bit like steroids in baseball. Um, and so I just don't respect. It's not a victimless crime uh, cheating. So I, I just, and I'm not saying Oates is cheating. I'm just saying that I don't respect coaches that delve into the crap of college basketball. I, I never have and I never will. Dan, what do you think about Oates' claim that he doesn't know what's going on in the pregame celebrations and pregame announcements because he's over there drawing up plays the entire time? And how would you have handled you know, something like that? Obviously very different from the Brandon Miller standpoint, but just with your team about any extracurricular stuff on the court celebration-wise with all of this going on right now. Yeah, I, I never pay. I, I agree with what Coach Oates said uh, before this. 
Like, you know, hey, I don't care. Kids are going to do what they're going to do, whatever. And you're, you're, you're drawing up where your tip play is. You're drawing up maybe something you want to make sure and go over before. Uh, you, you know, you've gone over 100 times, but you want the last thing them to see is your first offensive possession or your first defensive double team. So I get what he's saying there, but, but it all goes out the window the minute you're under this kind of scrutiny. Here's what I, you asked me what I would have done. I would have val- evaluated absolutely everything that we did, every comment on Facebook, every comment on Twitter, every comment on Instagram, every comment on TikTok, every single thing that we did would have been locked down and with a no-tolerance policy, uh, including that. Now, maybe that slipped Coach's mind, fine. Uh, But I'll tell you whose mind it didn't slip. It didn't slip Brandon Miller's mind. And it didn't slip Brandon Miller's mind to, after the game, put that on his profile of, uh, of, of Twitter. And to me, that was a direct slap in the face of everybody Uh, that was a victim of this. I think it was a direct, hey, screw you. I'm entitled. I'm going to be a pro. I'm going to make money. You suck. I'm great. And I'll be honest with you, I said this today on my show, I'm not sure that I don't, I'm not starting to think that Brandon uh, Brandon Miller isn't a little bit evil. I hate to call, it's a tough word, but I'm looking at this. How do you not have empathy? How do you not at least at some point Uh, publicly uh, express empathy for the family. Maybe it's a lawyer thing. Maybe it's a thing where, you know what, don't say anything because everything's going to be used against you. Well, maybe so. But I'm starting to believe this dude is a little entitled, a little pain in the backside, uh, almost evil human being to put what he put onto his Twitter page, now which he subsequently deleted, but to put that on there, Uh, after the uproar of it, basically to tell you, yeah, man, I don't play by society's rules. And and by the way, uh, and I know you guys know this, you guys have been awesome with it, but you can stop with that crap that he's just a kid. My backside, he's 20 years old. Look, I would have known enough when I was 12 uh, to feel guilty about even being involved around a murder. Hell, I feel guilty about stuff now. My wife makes fun of me. So I, uh, I have no respect for him, Miller, and I'm starting to think he's maybe evil. He maybe have a little bit of evil to him. Dan Donkich with us. Dan, what do you make of Jay Billis this weekend saying that if this would have been any player, the, the, the situation remains the same? The fact that he's not, the fact that he's the best player in the country has nothing to do with how he's treated. Well, Jay Billis never coached. I mean, let, let's be honest. Jay was like the, the law student, grad assistant, 20th assistant, getting the laundry for Coach K and, and going to be a lawyer. So Jay doesn't know. Jay has no idea. He acts as if he's a coach. And, you know, I really like Jay. But I'll, it, it, here, this is where we're at uh, with white media. I really believe this. I, white people in the media, particularly in basketball, are so afraid to say anything that could label them as an ist. What Bill has said was very safe. It was very, very safe. It got him on the side of players, got him on the side maybe of some coaches, but it's ridiculous. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, When he said, hey, look, uh, it would have been any player, that's just totally not true. I mean, I'm I'm sorry, but that's just, unless uh, Nate Oates is the most unique coach in the history of the world, your problems are always balanced against your production. Second thing Jay said, which I completely disagree with, is, well, you know, you got to protect the students' rights, and if you suspend them or do anything now, you're just protecting the university. Well, let me explain something to you. There are no rights to play basketball uh, on scholarship at a state university. It's not a right. It's a freaking privilege. And the second thing is, yeah, you're damn right I'm protecting the university. You're damn right I'm protecting the faculty, the students, uh, the workers, the RAs, the cafeteria workers, uh, the grounds. I'm protecting everybody on that university and their reputation. I got a kick out of that, but I've always said that. We've always pandered 18 to 23-year-olds. You know, guy gets on TV and you got to pander. And I'm just telling you, man, Dudes in the media, particularly white guys in basketball, they're scared to death. Uh, So Jay went the safe route. Uh, Good for him. Uh, He got through it. Nobody's on him except to say, what are you talking about? Obviously, it's ridiculous, but I'm always going to protect. I'll protect the player. I'll protect the player, but I'll also, once you're involved in murder, I don't, however you're involved, uh, and I'm the chancellor, and I'm, you know, on the board of regents, I'm the vice president, whatever. Uh, I'm protecting my school. And I will tell you this, this, this to, to, play, uh, to play this kid is not, it is not Nate Oates' decision. This is, 
the legal counsel, this is the president, this is the Board of Regents, bringing the AD and Nate Oates in. Uh, but you know what? If, he, if the president and the Board of Regents and the lawyers didn't want him to play, he wouldn't be playing. So, you know, that's just the way it is. But last thing, to say also that Alabama has handled this uh, perfectly, even Alabama, even, even Nate Oates admitted they didn't handle it right. Right. So Jay, as I said, Jay's a great guy, and Jay's just – he took the safe route. Good for him. He doesn't have any anybody on his backside except for OutKick. So there you go. Well, and, Dan, you're the only one of us three that's signed a contract as a head coach of a, a state university or, or any university. So the language yeah. in that contract, I would think, says something about, you know, protecting the university – protecting the athletic department, protecting the program and what you do and how you conduct your, your, your program. And I keep going back to, and this goes back to my now uncomfortability watching Alabama even play with Brandon Miller. They took a situation that was awful and tragic, but very well could have been just about Darius Miles and this other guy. And then, you know, you remove Brandon Miller from the team and okay, that's terrible for our team on the court, but it's about those guys. We're going to go forward with the guys who weren't involved with it in any way. And now it's turned things to when I watch an Alabama game, I find myself hating the fans that are cheering on Brandon Miller. I find myself hating the environment in that game on Saturday watching it and hating the Alabama fans that are cheering this team on. And what you could have done is separate that from the program where people like me or anyone else aren't thinking that every time they turn on a TV and watch a program – and now it feels like Nate Oates has made this about Alabama basketball and not just about the people involved with it. Is that fair or is that not fair on my part? Well, it's absolutely fair. And I, I, I'll tell you, you asked me what I would have done. I go back to this. You know, um, I would have suspended the kid. I, I just would have. Now, here's what would have happened. And, I, and, I, and you know, yeah, maybe the kid doesn't want to come back and play. Maybe he's mad, whatever. But you're involved in a murder here. I got to do something. So what would have happened is this. When that report came out, you know how Alabama and Alabama's co uh, obviously their board of regents and everybody doesn't think enough of that report from the jury or whatever it was uh, to sit him. So what would have happened was Nate Oates and Brandon Miller would have been now heroes for handling this in a harsher way than what people would have thought based on the report. Because Alabama fans will tell you right now, there's nothing to see here. Well, can you imagine if, if the school said, uh, Brandon, you're going to sit out a little bit. We're going to figure this whole thing out. That report comes out. The court of public opinion would have been with Brandon Miller and Nate Oates. It just would have. So, I, look, it's an untenable situation. But I always, I always said this, man, uh, and I got this from Coach Knight. Actually, I got this from my high school coach. We're not going to have rules here, but if you embarrass the university, you embarrass me, you embarrass your family, or you embarrass yourself, then we're going to have to deal with it. Clearly, this is an embarrassing situation. Uh, and clearly, uh, you know, Trey Wallace, I think he came on your show. He came on our show. He had studied kind of the code of conduct. And Seth Greenberg on my show today said something interesting and true. Look, if he is to be treated like every other student, then you got to treat him like every other student. And in the code of conduct, can't transport a gun on campus. Well, I don't know if you consider that campus. You know, that's that's a bit of a, I guess, a gray area. I don't know where he had it, where he didn't have it. I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, I don't care what anybody tells you. I do not care. They, uh, Brandon Miller is playing on that basketball team because he is a great player. And make no mistake, he is a great player. Alabama has a great season going, and the coach involved is gutless. Let's talk a little on court, Dan. How brutal was it for Michigan State to lose a game that way? Oh. They're up 10 with 39 seconds left against Iowa, and they lose that game in overtime. And I think Iowa was something like 6 for 8 or 6 for 9 from 3 during that stretch. It was an incredible comeback. Uh, I'm sure you've probably been on the side of something like that before in your coaching career. Can't be e easy for Tom Izzo and that team. Uh, you know what? I, every guy that's coached at all has been on one. I'll give you one. My first year at Bowling Green, we're down 13 with a minute four to go. True story. We take the lead. They throw a ball in our kid's face, technical, flagrant. Long story short, we take the lead with three seconds to go. 
and I only have four players because everybody's fouled out or hurt. I, my trainer won't let me put a hurt kid in. <laughs> Jamie Bosley, I'll never forget his name for Akron, hits a half-court shot to beat us after we came back from 13 down with a minute oh. three to go. He rips off his jersey and swings it around. <laughs> every coach, every coach has been on that. I was listening to two really good announcers, Robbie Hummel and Kevin Brown, and they were like astonished that this happened. Well, I got to tell you, they never coached. If you've coached, this has happened to you both ways. We were down 24 with 10 minutes to go at Kent when they went to the Elite Eight and we came back and won. You have always, that's why when fans start yelling for the walk on, when it's like <laughs> a minute to go and you're up 10, screw that, man, because you've been involved. Uh, Izzo crushed uh, McCaffrey completely insane. The stare down is the most idiotic thing I've ever seen. And I was sitting next to Bob Knight when he threw the chair. Give the kids credit from Iowa, man. They didn't quit. They hit five threes in a row. Uh, you're not going to see it again in the Big Ten because you've never seen it before in the Big Ten. It's history in the making. And then I, I happened to have the good fortune to turn over uh, to CBS at the very end of the Michigan-Wisconsin game. And I think that I'm tuning yeah. in to see Michigan's NCAA tournament hopes die right there on the court. And instead, Hunter Dickinson, a seven-foot center, turns and shoots from about 32 feet at the buzzer to tie it. And Michigan goes on and, and wins in overtime. That, that is what's great about this time of year, though, Dan. It, that felt like an NCAA tournament game between those two teams because it, they are either last four in or first four out, depending on how you look at both teams. And what a big swing for Michigan. Oh, so he, it's a it's, uh, game break. And I, I was at my son's game, Illinois State, and I happened to walk out, and I, the game was on, and I saw the block shot. So there's like 1.8 seconds to go down three. I went back in the game. I just let it go. Same thing Same thing with the damn Iowa game. I texted a buddy of mine and said, hey, we hit our UConn and Michigan State parlay. And he said, hey, idiot, turn the TV back on because they're in overtime. So <laughs> I missed both of them because my stupid self – but yeah, look. Every By the way, game I tuned in the exact same monstrous. time, Dan. I tuned in right to see the block <laughs> shot in the corner, and then I'm thinking, all right, well they got yeah. what, two point one. They were looking at the clock, one point eight or whatever it was. I tuned in the exact same time for that game. Yeah, yeah, and I was dumb enough to leave. But you know, a, a week or so ago, I was watching college basketball, and I was just flipping channels, and I happened to see the end of the Notre Dame. A Georgia Tech game, Georgia Tech hit a buzzer beater, and then I turned the next channel on, it was your guys, the Volunteers losing, literally two minutes later, at Vanderbilt on a buzzer beater. I've said forever, I've tweeted forever, my man Seth Greenberg, I gave him permission to steal it from me, but college basketball delivers every night. Monday night, there'll be a great game tonight. Tomorrow night, there'll be, a, it, it's every freaking night, college basketball delivers, man. It's the only sport, I guess baseball maybe, but, man, it's the only sport every freaking night something like that happens. Michigan, I don't know if they played their way in, but it was a big step. Uh, Wisconsin's uh, got work to do. Iowa comes to Indiana, coming off the win against Michigan State. Uh, it's on Super Tuesday. Huge game for the Hawkeyes. Bounce back. Can they do it? I don't know, but they need a win. A win at Indiana would be huge. These games are massive, man. These games are huge. Hey, by the way, how about your Hoosiers? I was there. I was wearing black. I was drinking beer on press row. Me and my buddy were the only ones. Purdue fans were so freaking cool to me, except one little D-bag. Looked like he was about 20 years old. I was in the, I was in the bathroom line, and he turns around. And he goes, hey, Doc, it's blank you. And he literally <laughs> ran out the other side. And I'm sitting there with some Purdue fans, and they're like, this happened to you a lot? I go, yeah, a little bit. A little bit. It does when I go. To but it was all, hey, Indiana. <laughs> Indiana does not make mistakes. And I've said this. I think I said this on your show last week. They don't make mistakes at the end of the game. I'm telling you, they're going to get a good shot. They don't. And in that gym, it was one of the great crowds I've ever been. I've never been to Mackey as a fan, always as a broadcaster or a player, whether we played there in high school, obviously college and all that. But man. What an unbelievable environment. And this kid, Hood Shafino, he, he shut the entire northern part of the state up, man. And I'm telling you guys, the greatest thing for a coach, I turn to my buddy, I go, man, listen, crowd's not to. Greatest thing for a coach is the sound of silence on the road. 
And Indiana, you got to give them credit. They're a hot team, man. They're not mad. They're, they're worthy of a, uh, of a few dollars on them to go to the Final Four. It's a pretty good basketball team. Follow him at Dan Dockich, but don't add him on social media. You can check out Don't At Me uh, weekday mornings, 9 a.m. Eastern. Dan Dockich, the host. Dan, thank you as always. Hey, Jonathan, thanks for coming on the show. All the women on our YouTube chat swoon when Jonathan <laughs> Hyde comes on the show. Man, it's like, oh, we're going to have because, Clay on tomorrow. We'll see. Yeah, they think I'm huh? either Clay or Chad. That's why. Yeah, the, the Q score for your no. show goes way up when Hutton comes on. That's for sure. Your Q rating is through the I roof. Have signed, oh, I have man. signed several autographs as Clay. That's a true story. I've introduced myself as Chad as well. You know, uh, one of the ladies said, hey, I dressed up a little nicer today for the YouTube chat. <laughs> we can't see her on the YouTube chat. <laughs> Hutton is the uh, Harry Styles of sports talk. There's no doubt. There you go. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. He's better dressed. Dan, thank you as always, man. Love having thanks, Dr. Guys. John. And uh, check out Don't At Me mornings, 9 a.m. Eastern, uh, right here on the, the Outkick Network. Chad, when we come back, um, there's another veteran that is available on the free agent market because the Washington Commanders have, had, have made a move at quarterback. That's next on Outkick 360. Welcome into Outkick the Show. I am Clay Travis, your fearless leader. I am going to continue to argue that sports is one of the great unifying forces in all of American life. ESPN is a sinking ship. Democrats are now the party of the white, woke college graduate. So the higher that number can be, the better you are with the committee. It's really that simple. You gotta lean into the turns. You really gotta lean into the turns. He's got incredible taste in, uh, <laughs> in which media figures he listens to. Very difficult to go back to back years in the NFL with the number one overall pick. I've been out of LA long enough to have forgotten that libs, no matter how ridiculous the scenario, are gonna live. Another week of inflation, another week with Biden with COVID, and another set of losers to crown. People don't watch the WNBA on TV, in person, on a plane, on a train, on a bus, or on purpose. The scary thing, Tommy, is in the history of this government, I've never seen them give anything back that they've taken. Oh, no, they never do. And they won't. Why are we going through Melania's goods? Don't make Brittany Griner out to be some type freedom fighter. Shouldn't there be a little bit of common sense? Let's roll them, big boy. What do you got? They want to find someone to be the face of domestic terrorism, and they want it to be a right-wing Trump supporter. Don't let them entrap you into doing something dumb. But they were hyper-rational. They looked at the data, and they said it makes no sense for me to submit to this COVID shot mandate get the yeah. shot or you can't go to your brother's wedding get the shot or you can't go to your daughter's graduation get the shot or else
Carson Wentz will be on his fourth team in four years. That's if, of course, he's somewhere uh, in 2023. The Washington Commanders, they have released him. They save about $20 million on the cap by releasing him and $24 million on what they owed him. So in, in total, from Philadelphia through Indianapolis and then now Washington, he's made a total of $106 million of his $160 million salary. And along the way, he's been traded for plenty of compensation. In fact, the commanders traded uh, last year a second-round pick plus a two third-round picks in order to receive Wentz and a seventh-round pick from Indianapolis. And on top of that, they picked up the contract that Indy didn't want to pay, which is why they traded him instead of cutting him. And now Wentz is on the open market yet again. Taylor Heineke, of course, was playing over him even whenever he came back and was back on the active roster off of PUP or off of IR, I should say. Uh, They played Heineke for a while, went back to Wentz to end the season. uh, And now they're saying Sam Howell's their QB1. But all bets are off based on the direction they could go with possible new ownership by then. And, Chad, we've, of course, got the combine this week all of the free agency things that can happen or trades that can happen. Washington hasn't been scared to trade for QBs in the past, namely Wentz. And here they are again a year later, Wentz is out. Failed experiment. It's got to be a backup now, right? Oh, yeah, I believe. I mean, I'm thinking about where would it be an upgrade for Carson Wentz to be your quarterback? And I I think even with a young quarterback who's struggling, you want to go with a young guy to see if he's got something. I just, we're past the point now of, oh, well, someone's going to get a slight upgrade at quarterback with Carson Wentz. We are past the point of him going into camp as the QB one. We have seen enough evidence now for me to believe that this guy's a backup. If he's going to keep playing in the league from here on out in his career, he is no longer a starter. You're not bringing him in to be the starter. You're bringing him. If he's a good presence in the locker room, to be a veteran option for a backup quarterback if your guy goes down. And he's a he's a good backup option, I think, for a team. If you're looking for a guy that maybe could get you. I always think of it, if, if your quarterback goes down for four games, do you have a guy who could possibly, with a good football team, get you a split? Can you go two and two with your backup if the pieces around the backup are good? I do think Carson Wentz could be that type of backup quarterback for a team. He can't be a starter anymore. Yeah, I don't know a single team that would want to bring in Carson Wentz to be their starting quarterback. Yeah, I, I'm with you. Uh, speaking of just the QBs, uh, Peter King says that the Panthers, Texans, Raiders, and Colts, they are not in on the Rodgers or Carr sweepstakes. So those four again, Panthers, Texans, Raiders, Colts, not in on the Rodgers or Carr sweepstakes. That means they're looking at the quarterbacks this week at the NFL Combine, as they should. Meanwhile... The Jets are reportedly, according to Albert Breer, they are also highly interested in Geno Smith returning to be their guy. So they've added him to the mix, as well as Daniel Jones, Ryan Tannehill, Jimmy Garoppolo, on top of Rodgers or Carr. So they're sticking with the vet mentality. But I was surprised to see that they're throwing Geno's name out there again. We had um, the the columnist on from uh, the New York Post last week. And he said, you know, think about the evolution of Geno Smith from where he's getting punched out yeah. by an undrafted guy, and he's a terrible guy in the locker room, to now where he is, where he's a leader in Seattle, and he's got the great comeback season, to now think about he could possibly have another opportunity with the Jets coming back to be the starter. Pretty remarkable transformation for Geno Smith's career where it looked like he was dead in the water. Hit us up with your thoughts at Outkick360. We've got other quarterback talk coming up. Chad. The Pac-12 and the the TV rights deals. We hit on this some last week, but something sparked your interest in this over the weekend. Yeah, they're screwed. Uh, The Pac-12 is right now. If you're looking for long-term money, they're not going to get it. I mean, you've got Disney saying that we are going to look at every single sports cost that's out there and start to cut back and be very selective on it. This is not a boom time where you've got these networks throwing in tons of money For sports properties, they're all looking at it with a possible recession taking place also thinking we we better really cherry pick 
those sports properties we want. Outside of the Big Ten and the SEC, no one is going to go into it and say, we have to have that Mm -hmm. in college sports right now, especially the Pac-12. So I think the best option right now for the Pac-12, the more I think about their situation, is to simply sign something that is a two- or three-year deal and then get what you can. You've got to piecemeal it together. I've read where uh, Prime Video and Amazon, they're interested in a Friday night Pac-12 after dark package that they can promote on their Thursday night NFL game for the next night. Mm -hmm. That would be an exclusive window for them. Get that deal done however you can. ESPN is still, they're they're wanting something late at night. Maybe they get one game also. Then you got to go to these regional networks, you know, to get other games, Ion or whoever it may be. They're going to have to get something where they get some money, but throw out the window any idea they're going to get anything approaching what the Big 12 is getting, what uh, obviously what the SEC or Big 10 is getting right now yep. also. But I, I say sign a short-term deal for this reason. Right now we're in a time where every big media company is saying, let's see what we're spending on sports programming in 2026, in 2027, 2028. We may be in a different time where it's a spending spree again because of streaming services or the return of cable or who knows what's going to be going on at that time. So if you can bridge it now, maybe you can get a huge profit three, four years from now. And maybe you have two services that combine forces to pull money together to where you have more of a a la carte opportunity. Yeah, that's all they can do. There's not going to be anyone with big money coming in and giving them everything they want. So if they get... You know, if Prime Video is really serious about they want to spend some good money for a Friday night package, we'll sell them that. Then go to ESPN for Saturday night. And then try to piecemeal it together where you get enough that you're not going you're, you're to deliver on what you've been talking this big game with of what each member institution is going to get in television money. But I think you take what you can for two, three, four years in the hopes that the economy – the way sports programming on television looks four years from now will be different. And then you go to you go play ball again at that time. Yeah, and by then... They're you, screwed right now. And you have to have a, a different group of teams involved too. By keep, but keeping your core together, what little is left. The core well, you get, of university. Let's talk about what they, who they, they talked to. San Diego State and SMU. They're going to argue we now have the Dallas market and the San Diego market. Right. That's fine. I don't know that media companies are really going to listen to them and say, oh, yeah, everybody in Dallas well, is big into SMU, so we now have that market. We but own you it. can still sell Oregon and yeah, you know, sure. the, the programs like that as long as they're still there. And those are the teams that are always going to be in that Saturday night ESPN package or Friday night prime video package if that happens. Yeah, and if they're not, because those are the desirable the programs. Right. <laughs> or the SEC. Or the SEC. Who knows? Don't count out the SEC. Who's going to be the quarterback of the Bears? Reports are they know. That's next. College football's in trouble. There's a lot of people trying to keep it from happening. I think it's a general consensus across the college football landscape. We want to play football. College football is a huge part of the fall. It's a huge part of Americana itself. It just really felt like people in the country needed college football to just feel a little sense of normal. Big news from the Big Ten as the conference releasing its 10-game football schedule. We go home thinking that we're going to be practicing the next day. Everybody gets a text, stay home, everything's canceled. Big Ten fall football season has been canceled. We just believe collectively there's too much uncertainty. I guess what I'm trying to understand, though, Kevin, is that was the same position you had six days ago. The Big Ten is an unmitigated disaster. There was a ton of confusion. There was presidents saying one thing. There was coaches saying another. Players had to be silent. Coaches had to be silent. ADs had to be silent. People said, how does what you just did make any sense? And nobody really knew what the heck happened when they voted to cancel the season. You make this huge historical announcement, and then Kevin Warren never does a press conference to explain it. It was like a masterclass in how not to handle a crisis. The word really that was lacking in all this is transparency. It felt like a lot of stuff was happening behind closed doors. Even today, we still don't know what occurred. So you don't tell us parents, that's fine, but you're not telling the young men that it affects. We have to make a decision to save the season. What about the history books? 
What about the rivalry games? What about Paul Bunyan's axe? How is that not going to go to a team this year? This is a failure of epic magnitude. The Big Ten presidents and leaders should be held accountable for the disastrous decisions that they're making. Then the commissioner doubles down, saying his decision will not be revisited. And that's the point it felt like a war was declared on the Big Ten and Kevin Warren. Play. Everything turns political. Because if this is medical, then you would have stopped the game of football a long time ago. I think the Big Ten leaders will tell you that they probably made a mistake in hindsight. If I had the chance to do it all over last year, um, I would I would do uh, make the same decisions that we made. Just like that, the second hour is here. Glad you're with us. Monday edition, Hutton and Withrow with you for Outkick 360. Sixth and Peabody, our location each and every day with Yeehaw Beer and Old Smoky Moonshine. The Chicago Bears, they've reportedly now decided they're leaning towards trading out of the number one overall selection. In effect, guaranteeing that they're sticking with Justin Fields for the foreseeable future. Uh, Adam Schefter with the tweet earlier today, the Bears have already been approached by multiple teams about trading the draft's number one overall pick, and Chicago is said to be leaning toward moving the pick. So the number one pick is now, uh, looks like it's, it's for sale. The question is to which organization? Who's going to fall in love with one of these quarterbacks this week, or maybe they already have? But we will see multiple reports uh, involving multiple QBs that will be considered for number one overall. And the price tag is higher because of the need at quarterback for Houston, who picks second. But if you're Houston, now you got to jump up there and grab number one if you want your guy. And it could be any of them. But if you want your guy, if you're Houston, after winning at the end of the season and Chicago losing, in effect, guaranteeing that flip-flop from number one to number two. Now you may need to do it by trading draft picks. And Houston can move up to number one. Potentially, Chicago still gets the, the best defender, whoever that might be. They could get the best defender on the board by the fourth selection, for instance, which is currently Indianapolis, who's also quarterback needy. If I'm Chicago, I am hoping that, first off, whoever you are, you're wanting to get up to number one if you're quarterback needy. Got to have it. And you know who your guy is. Yep. The only way that Houston would be okay you know, sitting there at two would be to say, oh, we're kind of undecided on uh, Stroud and, 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 Young. and Bryce Young. I, I just don't think that front offices and GMs would operate that way. They've got their guy. They know one way or the other. So you trade up and get that guy. Now, if I'm wanting to do business and, I, and I'm the Bears – I'm really hoping that Carolina at nine 
or Indy, which is you know right in the middle there, sandwiched mm-hmm. in the middle of those top ten picks. I want one of those franchises to have to trade up or want to trade up because you're going to get more of a haul in return. Yes. And I'm fine moving down to, let's say, nine. I've always circled Carolina as a team that could move up. David Tepper desperate to get that franchise guy. What if it's Bryce Young? So they give up a ton, move up from nine to one. Bears move back to nine, get a haul of picks or whatever it is in return to do that so Carolina can uh, trade up to get Bryce Young. To me, that's the dream scenario. No surprise that the Bears want to trade this pick. When I see a report like this, Hutton, I also immediately think they must now be getting some serious offers. Yeah. Or, you know, they're, they're knowing what they're going to get. So now let's we can put it out there to Adam Schefter. Yeah, we're leaning towards trading this pick because the haul we're going to get in return is pretty enticing. And they probably have, you know, a couple of different teams they're talking with right now to drive up that price. And this is normally where you will see some conversations happen for, for the draft. Scenarios will be tossed around. This is where the, the, the Titans traded back out of number one to pick 12 the year they drafted Jack Conklin and the year that the Rams went with Jerry Goff. They were talking about this trade this week at the NFL Combine. So uh, not surprising that the news starts to come out as agents – and teams and media arrive in Indianapolis, especially the the likes of, you know, Albert Breer, Adam Schefter, Ian Rappaport, and, and others. There will be more of this. And we already discussed the hype train that will be Will Levis and Anthony Richardson this week. They'll both be throwing at the Combine, as will C.J. Stroud. Bryce Young will work out at his pro day, but he'll be going through all the measurements uh, where the report is he's going to be uh, – Five ten and a half is is what the uh, official measurement's going to be. We won't have that till later in the week, but that was the report. And the question then comes down to: Are you comfortable with the smaller stature QB at number one, and what's the value of getting ahead of Houston to get him? How important is he to your franchise versus a CJ Stroud or Will Levis, which you can get in the top ten? And if you're Chicago got roughly a hundred million dollars in cap space this is the right decision a hundred million dollars in cap space to build around your franchise QB that you traded up for a couple of seasons ago it's time to build around it the one quarterback Chad going into this this season this past season that didn't have the luxury of the salary cap space and the moves that were being made was fields the other second year quarterbacks had more of a buy-in from the free agent market to get some help. And now it's, now it's Fields' turn as Chicago turns to the trade options. They will get a nice haul for number one this year. I realize in saying this that with the Giants, it was really just the coaching change and philosophical change that led to Daniel Jones having a breakout season this past year and getting better coaching from Brian Dayball. That is what I would expect if I'm the Bears from Justin Fields. I'm not sold on him as a player. Mm -hmm. They've also given him nothing. Right. Nothing. But with that cap space they have, with draft pick possibilities, I'm not saying the guy's going to be all pro overnight, but there needs to be a substantial move up from a play standpoint for Justin Fields based on what you provide around him this offseason. Bears are in a great position to provide a lot around him and upgrade at a number of spots to help out their young quarterback, but he's got to take the next step too. I am I am expecting a jump the way we saw Daniel Jones yeah. from last year to this season from Justin Fields. If that happens, you feel great about him as the franchise quarterback. If that doesn't happen or it's more of the same and they add around him, the Bears will be regretting not using that number one pick on Bryce Young. That That's, that's what's going to happen this next season. That's how big this is. For Justin Fields. Uh, it's, yes, and, and too early to punt on him given what's been around him. The Bears, while they had three wins, they were competitive in some games, in large part and sometimes the only part, due to what Fields was doing, more with his legs than his arm, but rushing for 1,200 yards and setting records in a single game for rushing. There are ways to maximize all of his potential. There is... Uh, so... I think the foregone conclusion is that we're going to see Rodgers in New York. But not everybody's on board with that. Joe Klecko, who is headed to the Pro Football Hall of Fame 
uh, elected as part of the senior committee for the class of 2023. He was recently on the Zach Kelb show and had this to say about the possibility of Rogers joining Gain Green. Are you hoping they find the way to pull off a deal for Rogers? No, no, I don't. I, I don't. I don't think Rogers is a fit with the young guys. You know, I, I relate them to myself with a young team that came up when we started winning, and why it was a good fit with all of us because we all worked together and came up together. You know, and I just think you know I've watched Rogers over the years. He's a great player. Hey, listen, you don't become MVP three times without doing what he's done. But you know, when he he didn't have the, the you know the 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 perfect arrangement with receivers and, and game plan and, and the line, you know, his, his attitude was condescending so much to the players, even when they would come back to the huddle and all. And I can't see that, you know, like Wilson, you know, he won the, the uh, rookie of the year uh, offense player. I can't see him coming back to the huddle, and, you know, Rogers Lambeth and he was running the wrong route, you know? I mean, you just, it's not going to fit. I don't see it. You know, I see a guy like Carr, who's a, you know, who's an all-pro. He hasn't been an MVP, but he's had some great years. But I, I just can't see, you know, uh, them going after, uh, after, you know, a guy that has had all his years and had his way, and then when it doesn't turn out his way, he goes dark. <laughs> you know, I, I just can't see it. So you can see him ruin the locker room is what you're saying. Absolutely. You got a young bunch of guys who are fighting with each other. And you have a come to you have to bring a guy in who has his own opinion about things. I think that can turn a turn a bad a bad feeling in that locker room. Former Jets defensive lineman and now a Pro Football Hall of Famer uh, this coming summer, Joe Klecko there with the thoughts through uh, Odyssey. Chad, I don't necessarily disagree with what he's saying based on this past season in Green Bay, where Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs were certainly getting the cold shoulder early on for what was a young locker room, a young wide receiving core in Green Bay. It's hard to overlook the fact, though, if Rodgers joins the Jets with that defense, with the run game, and with the talent they have at receiver, that they don't make that massive leap into not just a playoff contender, but we're talking titles because Rodgers is there versus any other quarterback option right now. What Klecko is saying is completely fair. I understand where he's coming from with that uh, about Aaron Rodgers and where he is in his career and what the Jets may need right now. But ultimately what the Jets need is a really good quarterback play with the players they have around them. And Aaron Rodgers, uh, of the ava possible available guys, mm -hmm. he is the far and away best option that can give you really good quarterback play. So I don't think it's a bad move for the Jets to go after Aaron Rodgers and get him. And I, I don't think it would be an issue with the locker room. Now, we talked about this last week. You need to gauge what his level of commitment is right now and how much he's going to put in to being a good teammate, to learning his teammates, to helping them along some with whatever the offense is going to look like with Aaron Rodgers, with the Jets. I understand all that. I also think, and we had a Packers writer on about this, when you doubt Aaron Rodgers and you tell him he can't do something or that he's not smart enough about something or that he's going to be bad at something, that's where he's at his best. Pissed off Aaron Rodgers is pretty good. Uh, I think he lost some of that because of his disenchantment with the Packers organization, the, especially this past year and the direction they went and what the roster looked like. Give him a fresh start with the Jets. Doubt him the way Joe Klecko is. Talk about his inability to get along with young players and how he's condescending in the huddle. I think that motivates Aaron Rodgers to be a great teammate and to help Garrett Wilson and other young stars along with that Jets team. So... This may be the type of motivation that Aaron Rodgers needs if you've got Joe Klecko and others saying he can't get along and go along with a new team and help a really good young roster. Yeah, put him on there, and I, it's one of the best landing spots he could hope for uh, this offseason based on the other scenarios and quarterbacks that will have some moving carousel feel to it uh, this offseason. Washington mentioned the headline earlier. They've released Carson Wentz. They're also, according to The Athletic, and the New York Post, uh, they're banning Jeff Bezos from actually making a qualifying offer, a bid, to buy the Washington Commanders. This goes straight from uh, the, the report here, where Bezos has been told by Bank of America, which is the commander's banker, that he's barred from making a bid for the embattled NFL team, 
The ban has reportedly been known for months. That hasn't stopped Bezos from recently hiring an investment firm to explore bid. The reason Dan Snyder's camp is reportedly preventing one of the richest men in the world from offering billions of dollars for the team is pretty personal. This also from The Athletic. Snyder has believed for years that the Washington Post, which has been owned by Bezos for uh, a decade or so, has been working to oust him. And he's been reluctant to sell the team, despite the pleas of fans and owners likely behind the scenes, media for sure. And while the NFL owners haven't voted to push him out, they, didn't, they haven't gotten to the point where they voted and had the 25 owners vote to push him out, they're also sitting back waiting on him to sell the team so that they can just you know wash their hands of this and move on. And while Bezos is doing the background work, this is why the reports continue to be floated out there that they're considering a bid. Well, they're not, according to The Athletic and Washington Post, because Bezos isn't allowed to make a bid per Bank of America through, of course, Daniel Snyder. So who's really winning here? <laughs> this is the big question I have with all this, because it really is just based on your perspective. I get that billionaires are all about what they own and what they can own and not necessarily about how much money they have in their bank account. But if you're Daniel Snyder, you have run an organization into the ground and you have the world's richest man ready to cut you an enormous check, a record-setting check for a pro sports team to buy that team. You are going to take this guy's money to buy something that you ran straight into the ground. So who's really winning in that transaction right there? Now, it's Daniel Snyder telling you that, well, it's Jeff Bezos winning because he owns my football team now. And I can't have a guy who trashed me and tarnished my reputation and covered me in a way that I see as unfair owning my football team. And I just laugh at it and think, first off, both kind of seem like losers at this point. But also, you're both winners. Bezos gets what he wants. If you can drive up the price with Bezos and get even more, in the cell than you would have with anyone else. If you're Daniel Snyder, you win also. But the pissing contest back and forth, I feel like we all kind of lose from that. It's just a funny story to me. Yeah. Daniel Snyder's not going to lose in any of this. He's no. going to get a huge payday. Right. Jeff Bezos isn't going to lose in any of this. Well, he's going to hand over the money that he has to buy an NFL team that he's always wanted, or he's not, and he's still going to have that money. And the world continues to spin right along. So the report from The Athletic also stated that the highest offer so far has been $5.5 billion. Keep in mind, the Broncos sold for roughly a million 8. less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if you're – Snyder's wanting upwards of seven. Um, many thought that they, they could get a high bid of 6.5. But if you're not going to come in and offer much more than what's already been offered, either, I, and I don't think it clarifies who's made that offer – it could be uh, Josh Harris, owner of the 76ers, who also is from the D.C. area. Uh, there are others who have made uh, bids. Byron Allen, for instance. But um, recently, there's a, a, one of the Tillman uh, brothers, Fertitta brothers, Tillman Fertitta uh, in Houston, owner of the Rockets, I believe. He's also made an offer for the Commanders franchise. So there are others, if you wanted to block out Bezos, and the reason why Bezos continues behind the scenes to go about this, and I mentioned this earlier during the football season, the Seattle Seahawks are going to be for sale soon because right now it's through the Allen Trust where Paul Allen left it to his family. Uh, namely, I believe his sister is the one running the organization currently as the controlling owner. But it's going to get to a point where they're out of funds to, it's more profitable to sell than it is to keep the franchise because as a part of the trust, as a part of everything that Allen left, they left a great deal of it to charities. And that's where the money's going to go. So that's going to be allocated for sale. I believe the report earlier this, uh, late last year, around 2024, maybe as early as 2025. But if you know that and you're Bezos, you go ahead and do all of the background work and you go ahead and get into the pool where you're vetted to where the NFL owners you know are going to vote you through and you are the next owner of said franchise. There are ways to become an NFL owner without having to go through the channel of Daniel Snyder, and it's on the foreseeable future. And it makes a ton more sense for Jeff Bezos to own the Seattle Seahawks 
as opposed to the Washington Commanders, to me, just based on the possibility of what could happen. That makes a ton of sense if it works out that way. And, and so that, I'm just saying that's why you go through the effort, even if you're not going to be able to have your yeah. offer considered You go you know, ahead and legit. lay – if there's a team for sale, you put your name through, you do all the vetting, and that way you're lined up quickly for whatever else comes for sale. At but, any point. Hey, but also, and these teams don't go come up for sale very often. No, no. And but but also if Snyder's not getting what he wants, does he do an about face and just say, Hey, uh, yeah, I'm not selling. I haven't received what He's I want. He's gonna get what he wants. So I, I don't I don't foresee that being an issue for him. Well, and now more names are being dropped in. If the best bid is already, what'd you say, about a billion more than the Denver Broncos? It, roughly, yeah. It's five and a half right now. I don't know how you wouldn't how that wouldn't meet your expectations of what the team is worth if you're Daniel Snyder. Chad, another surprise team to keep an eye on for rookie quarterback and moving up, and maybe they don't have to, but based on where they're currently selecting, they, unless they're in the Richardson camp, I think they're going to have to move up Tampa Bay. Because right now, there is a belief that they're going with Kyle Trask. And while this is all true based on the depth chart they have right now, this is not the direction they're going to turn. Kyle Trask can be on the roster as the backup. He was the third string this past season. This is not the QB1. We've heard that before. We've seen the QB1 things before from other franchises, uh, namely Andy Dalton in Chicago, and then they draft Justin Fields. This is not going to last long. We had Bruce Arians on at the Super Bowl, and he even said in the interview with us, Kyle Trask is a great kid. You know, not speaking ill of him, but, you know, we definitely have to look around and see what we got, what's behind door number two, what's behind door number three, other than Kyle Trask. Um, that told me that they're going to have someone else other than him. Look, you are tanking with Trask. If he's the starter, to me, this is a clear indication that you are tanking with Trask, and I don't know who you're tanking for, but you are fine having a miserable season and getting a high draft pick and then drafting someone <sighs> else. I, I would throw out where they are. You know, you mentioned Anthony Richardson, Hendon Hooker. Is he a name that yeah, rises in right. the draft? I mean, there are potential franchise quarterbacks, not right away, but you could bridge it with Kyle Trask and get to that player. I would put Richardson and Hooker in that camp that they could possibly draft as well. But, I mean, you're not winning with Kyle Trask. Jeff Darling. Bruce Arians told us that. Recently on ESPN said, quote, they do feel at least Kyle Trask is at least likely to be the guy under center. I feel pretty confident they're going that direction, end quote. Uh, for right now, yes. They're going in that direction for the offseason prior to the NFL draft. That's how I would Yeah, I mean, look, that. you got to talk about what you have on your roster right now before things happen. So there's nothing wrong with that statement, but that's what you're doing right now before you find your quarterback. Right. We have Kyle Trask, guys, so he's the best quarterback that we have. <laughs> so my inclination would be to say that Kyle Trask will be the Bucks quarterback based on the fact that it's a bird in hand and we have him, so he's probably going to be the guy. It really means nothing. It also tells me that they're still looking around trying to find a better option. Coming up, by the way, uh, Tampa Bay picks 19th currently. Plenty of QB needy teams ahead of them. And if you're on board with the idea that we're going to have not three but four, potentially five first-round quarterbacks, Tampa's going to have to do some wheeling and dealing unless they're going to sign someone this offseason. And to me, with Brady now gone, it makes more sense to move in the direction of the young QB more so than it does sign a veteran for a short-term solution. And you can still keep Trask on your roster like they've had the past couple of years. Coming up, we'll discuss Major League Baseball and the TV dilemma they have now and the solution they need to find moving forward. And at what point does winning not take over the number one priority for a program, for a campus, for a university? That's next on Outkick 360. Hey, guys, let's move on to probably the thing more people are talking about, unfortunately. Uh, for baseball than anything, which are the new rule changes. Uh, I'm going to start off by saying I think they all suck uh, and are horrible. Uh, so uh, I'm coming from that angle. Um, and, and I know that, again, sounds like the uh, old man get off my lawn theory, but the game uh, 
Baseball was the only game, uh, really, the only game without a, a clock, the only game left without a clock. And now that that, that is changing, I'm, I'm not happy about that. But we'll talk about, uh, start off with the, the kind of the inconsequential ones, a bigger base. You know, here's the only complaint I have about that. A hun over 100 years ago when baseball was invented, uh, it was mathematically perfect. The diamond was mathematically perfect. 90 feet between bases, 60 feet, 6 inches from the mound to the plate, and I think 135 feet from home plate to second base. All of those things created the statistical uh, uh, hall of fames that we have. Um, you take six inches away from the mound, you're going to have drastically different batting averages and career batting averages. You change the the, the base pass, uh, shorten or lengthen, you're going to have a dramatic impact. Uh, the base being a little bit bigger, I don't think is going to do absolutely anything for player safety. I think it's just going to look stupid. Uh, it'll give advertisers a bigger face uh, on the bases, which you know is going to happen. Um, if they wanted to truly take care of player safety, they, they would have done what softball did and put an alternate bag on the outside of the baseline and have the runner run to that instead of running to the same bag. So I, I think that's kind of a dumb one, and I don't think it's going to have much to do. Um, the pitch clock. Uh, so as a pitcher, I can tell you this. The only pitchers in professional baseball that will be affected by the pitch clock are pitchers that suck, period. It, it, it's 20 seconds, I think, between uh, return of the ball and the next pitch with nobody on. I think it's 30 seconds with runners on or whatever. That should never, ever come into play. A good pitcher gets rid of the ball, in my opinion, uh, 8 to 10 to 12 seconds after he gets it back. There's no – and the only thing that delays that is the batter stepping out of the box, which can no longer happen, which is, you're going to see some guys are going to have a lot of problems with that. You watch spring training, if nothing else, for that. Um, but the pitch clock is not going to be something that's going to impact anybody that's any good because uh, good pitcher – well, I mean, one of the etiquettes of being a good pitcher is you get the ball back and you, and you throw because you keep your defense on their toes – uh, you keep everybody in the game. And when you're in the dog days of summer and you're out, uh, used to be uh, not as much anymore, but I, I can remember being on uh, St. Louis's artificial turf and it was 165 degrees uh, for the everyday players. And getting your, your team off the field quickly in a hot summer day is a good thing. Plus, again, you're going to find that pitchers that work faster will give up fewer unearned runs and will have better defensive metrics behind them uh, as a whole. Um, so the pitch clock, eh, whatever. Um, the runner at second base is stupid now as it was then. Just stupid, stupid, stupid. Uh, don't get it. Don't understand. I know what they're trying to do, but I just think it's dumb and it takes away. Uh, plus, it's also going to change statistics. You're going to get an RBI. Pitcher's not going to have to give up an earned run.
6th and Peabody, our location with Yeehaw Beer and Old Smoky Moonshine. Fun and Withrow with you. Glad you're with us across the Outkick Network. Chad, simple question. At what point does winning not become the top priority? And I ask that because that's what I'm thinking as I watch what took place in Tuscaloosa this past weekend. And it, we saw it last week where he can, Brandon Miller continued to play. But the double down and then the way he handled everything from the pregame introduction where he's getting, you know, frisked, tap, it, it, it patted down, it just look it, optically awful. It's just stupid. But they know what they're doing. And on top of that, putting that as the banner of your social media account, then deleting said account for, further validates that he's doubling down on whatever Nate Oates is saying and not saying. I mean, I'm assuming he put this up as the banner right after Nate Oates' presser where he said, I assure you it's not going to happen again the rest of the season. I mean, it's just they're going to continue to win. They're a very good team. Brandon Miller is a great player. But if you're the university, at what point do you have to say, look, there's a 23-year-old mother who died, who was killed, who was shot on the strip in Tuscaloosa, and we have players involved in this facing capital murder charges. And on top of that, our top player, and no one's disputing it, brought the gun back to the scene, which was used for said shooting. At what point do you say, yeah, we've got to sit him. We've got to sit him. And instead, they play him, and I mean, I'm not surprised that he was cheered. I've seen uh, in our own backyard here, Pac-Man Jones was cheered after uh, a shooting that took place in Las Vegas at a strip club, um, which is uh, another awful uh, set of circumstances. My point is, winning isn't everything, and this is a good example of it, where you have to take a step back and be like, what's really important here? And what's important is Harris, who we're naming a lot of names, the last name of Harris, that family who lost a 23-year-old daughter, that should be the focus of what we're discussing. And instead, it's a pat down, it's ice in the veins, it's wrong place, wrong time. Kids, you know, they're going to go out and they're, they're going to do this, they're on a college campus, whatever. The focus should be elsewhere, and instead the focus is on winning. I, and I've got a radical spin on that, Hutton, to this question. It's a simple it's a simple question. I'll give you the simple answer to your question. This isn't worth it. What they're being hit with right now and the way people are going to look at this team and the way Nate Oates has handled it with multiple dumb comments, with the pat-down thing that I don't care if it happened all year or not, is completely tone-deaf and well, idiotic. Well, Oates isn't even sure if it has. Yeah, Because he doesn't watch it. Well, the whole thing is just stupid, right? I mean, it makes them look dumb. It makes them look careless. Um without a heart. Yeah. There's a lot of things that I think about Alabama basketball right now, and none of them good other than the fact they're beating a lot of teams, and Brandon Miller's a lottery pick that's probably going to go on and have a great NBA career. Other than that, can't say a lot of kind things about Alabama's basketball program or their fans at this point in time. And the fan part of it is expected. I mean, I, that's any fan base. Look, they're going to act stupid, and right. Alabama fans are going to act stupid around this thing, and they're going to blindly defend – anyone around their program. So none of that really surprises them, but us. They're, they're also echoing the decision that has or has not been made. They're echoing that from their own university that they're fans of in response to those critical of the decision the university made. Going back to yeah. Dan Dockage last hour who said, like, you know, if, if they get out ahead of this, the coverage is way different than the way that we were responding to it last week and the way that it was handled internally and publicly through your head coach. Well, let me give you a radical spin on this. At what point is winning honestly detrimental, detrimental to their program? Uh, and I'll, I'll, say, I'll say it this way. They're going to get more and more of a spotlight the further they go on and the more they win, and they're going to look more and more heartless the more they win. Example, this thing happened back in mid-January, and... Darius Miller in Alabama. Darius Miller, after you know being around this, Brandon Miller. Let, uh, did I say Darius Miller? Sorry, Darius Brand, Miles. Brandon Miller. Da Darius Miles. Yeah, yeah. Brandon Miller. After this happened with Darius Miles, Brandon Miller was there. Uh, he saw it. He fled the scene when this happened. And then what? A couple days later, 
the day after all this news drops, he goes to Vanderbilt and they win a game in ho-hum fashion. Then the news gets out about him having a part in this and physically delivering the murder weapon to the scene of the murder of a young mother. He goes out and has 41 points against South Carolina. There, there's a heartless factor to this that's really, really concerning uh, that I, I don't quite understand. I feel like it affected the rest of his team in that game against South Carolina and has not affected Brandon Miller in the least. Now, Bama fans will give this a standing ovation and tell us how you know, the kids fought through all this and whatever. Well, you know, I, I wish the young mother had a chance to fight through anything would be my response to that. And I think the more they win, the worse they look. If they were to lose quickly in the NCAA tournament, I think everyone would say, well, that's what you get, right? At some point, it's got to affect you negatively when yeah. all this is going on. If they win and win and win and win and win a national title, uh, I'm watching this documentary right now on SEC Network about the heritage of Southern hoops, and it's a five- or six-part documentary, and they go through some of the best teams in history, and they profile, and I'm thinking, what will they say 40 years from now about the 2022-2023 Alabama basketball team if they go on to win a national title? Are we really going to censor this part of it out of the story and not discuss it and not talk about how uncomfortable all of it is that the coach failed to act at all with the star player when all this is going on? Or are we going to treat this historically the way it should be treated as an abomination, as something that should not be allowed to go on, as something where if the coach and the AD or the president in Alabama is not going to step in, is someone in the SEC going to st step in? Is the NCAA going to step in? I mean, we we saw it at Baylor well, when a lot of things went south. We right? know the NCAA is not stepping in. A lot of other people had to step in, not Baylor people, when things got out of control. So it's just, it's an awful look. I think they're going to keep winning because it hasn't affected them yet. So if it hasn't affected them yet, I doubt it's going to. But that would be the spin on the question, Hutton. Does the winning almost affected even more negatively where people well, say, well, I hope you guys are happy. I don't know, though. This is what you got, and now the family gets to watch you guys win all the time, and this just gets to continue. I don't know if it's winning as, as much as what's going on as they win. Like the introduction of Brandon Miller and, you know, you have the, the pat-down. Like that's, that's the highlight of what we're discussing. Meanwhile, if you rewind to, what, last Wednesday night, the highlights, the 41 points that the guy put up, sent it to overtime, then won it in overtime at South Carolina. Um, this is different. This is the, as I said on Docs this morning, spitting in the face of the family that, that lost a loved one. You know, and, and that's, that's where the focus has shifted. It's now like, oh, you know, everyone's calling for me to sit. I'm, you know, pat me down, you know. It, it, optically, just how awful that is. On top of the fact that they're, they're allowing him to play, they're not sitting him, they continue to make excuses for why or why not, and the little that they actually say, they're making excuses. But even after the introduction antics, Chad, Nate Oates is sitting at a podium saying, yeah, this is, this is something that I'm told has been going on all year. I mean, I, I don't know, I don't watch it, but you know, it's not going to happen again the rest of this season. I can, I can guarantee you that. And then he posted on social. So, uh, again, that... We'll wait for the next excuse as long as the media will ask the question because the SID is saying game only questions, questions about the game only. It's no game here. Like oh, that, that's and, and, the... hey Hutton, you know, don't worry about that because they've been doing it all year, and that's just an MMA thing. And there's nothing. Did no one think after someone was killed no. that hey maybe come we on. should cool it on the pat down as you come through the starting lineup? Oh, by the way, they knew apparently knew about Brandon Miller being in the car. When the, where the gun was and all this going on, they continue to do it. There's not one person within the Alabama program smart enough to stop that. I don't buy it. Right. I think they're thumbing their nose at all of this. And the I, whole I situation. I don't believe that it's just coincidence. And I think that Alabama fans are emboldening them to do so with the way they're behaving. Right. And they're just going to continue to puff their chest out and act like it's us versus the world and everyone else is wrong and we're right and we've done nothing wrong and there's no introspection here. There's no one looking in the mirror asking if they could have handled it better before or after this t terrible, tragic incident and crime. No one's doing any of that. 
And the fact that we're now shining a light on this Alabama media system where an SID has the gall to go into a press conference and say only questions about the game, I credit, and I want to find the reporter who did it, the first question. Chad, not only that, was, just real quick, not on, and find it. Not only is he saying uh, ask only questions regarding today's game, he's doing it the Saturday after in the same week where the preliminary hearing named Brandon Miller as the guy who brought the gun back to the scene. So less than a week, a full week later, they're already saying, yeah, questions only about the game. Yeah, it was Nick Kelly. Uh, well, Nick Kelly of the Tuscaloosa News, he reported that when the first question was, have you reached out to the victim's family? Uh, Nate Oates said, I apologize for my previous, previous comments this week. We understand the severity of it all. I'm following the administration's lead on everything here. We're going to talk about the game only is what they would like for me to talk about. It's cowardice. And you know what that is also is? They can hide behind attorneys all they want. If nothing that they have done, if they're not questioning it at all, and they feel like they've followed protocol and done everything the right way, they're not hiding behind this. Well, They're willing to talk about it more. They, the fact also, that they're telling their coach, don't answer any questions about it, to me shows that they feel like they've done something wrong. Well, here. they don't want... Deep down, anymore, they feel that way. They, they don't want any more news to get out about what they did or didn't know because something that Nate Oates said earlier last week... Shows they didn't really know. Compared, or maybe they did. Well, well, he says, yeah, we knew about that. And answering the first initial response to the report, and not that the report, the testimony from the officer and law enforcement that's on the scene and was testifying to this in the preliminary hearing that eventually was, of course, now we'll head in front of a grand jury... Um, he's saying, yeah, we knew about that wrong place, wrong time. And then Greg Byrne later in the week prior to tip off at South Carolina is saying, yeah, I didn't find out about that text from Darius miles until the, the, the hearing took place until that testimony was known. So again, you're getting both sides of an answer and they're, what they're doing now is saying, yeah, coach is only going to talk about the game. We're going to have one voice in this. And maybe I mean, if that based on the details that will end up coming out. We'll get further reports of the, the grand jury and whether or not they come forward with indictments on the other two. Well, and look at all the missteps. But we won't hear anything else about Miller. Not just the decision not to discipline Miller at all within the program, whether it be a, a lengthy suspension or removing him from the team. Right. Not just that, but Nate Oates, his insensitive comments when he was first asked about it. The pat-down celebration, the right. frisking celebration, that then he had to come out and open his press conference saying that that's not going to happen again, and it was inappropriate. So it's just one thing after the Greg Byrne things are great when you bring up about, oh, I thought you guys knew all about this. Nope, the AD says, I didn't know about this, and the text message until the day it was leaked in the grand jury hearing. So there's all these things. They've botched it so severely, you understand why now it is, nope, we're not talking about any of it because we're tired of having to apologize every time we open our mouths about it. Right. Well, tough the media doesn't have to abide by that they get to ask whatever they want so kudos to the reporter that yeah. stepped in there and asked that question first regardless of what the SID said coming up Major League Baseball's TV distribution problem and how to solve it plus uh, the worst will of fortune answer maybe ever that's next on Outkick 360 Welcome into Outkick the Show. I am Clay Travis, your fearless leader. I am going to continue to argue that sports is one of the great unifying forces in all of American life. ESPN is a sinking ship. Democrats are now the party of the white, woke college graduate. So the higher that number can be, the better you are with the committee. It's really that simple. You gotta lean into the turns. You really gotta lean into the turns. He's got incredible taste in, uh, <laughs> in which media figures he listens to. Very difficult to go back to back years in the NFL with the number one overall pick. I've been out of LA long enough to have forgotten that libs, no matter how ridiculous the scenario, are gonna live. 
Another week of inflation, another week with Biden with COVID, and another set of losers to crown. People don't watch the WNBA on TV, in person, on a plane, on a train, on a bus, or on purpose. And the scary thing, Tommy, is in the history of this government, I've never seen them give anything back that they've taken. Oh, no, they never do. And they won't. Why are we going through Melania's goods? Don't make Brittany Griner out to be some type freedom fighter. Shouldn't there be a little bit of common sense? Let's roll them, big boy. What do you got? They want to find someone to be the face of domestic terrorism, and they want it to be a right-wing Trump supporter. Don't let them entrap you into doing something dumb. But they were hyper-rational. They looked at the data, and they said it makes no sense for me to submit to this covid shot mandate get the yep. shot or you can't go to your brother's wedding get the shot or you can't go to your daughter's graduation get the shot or else
Is this the worst Will of Fortune guess ever? Yes. Okay, 360 rolls on. Yes, it is. Uh, there's only one I can come up with that is right there on par, but this from Chad Mosher on social. I don't think I've ever heard a single audience member audibly have such a violent reaction on Will of Fortune as this lady did when a poor contestant called a G in fresh. So the answer is fresh tropical fruit. <laughs> And instead of the S in fresh... Every letter is available, and, except for the S in fresh. And this... I'm sorry, every, every letter is on the board yeah. already. All they're lacking is the S in fresh. And it spells out tropical G. fruit. <laughs> they mean, went with G. This the, is next level. Now, my question is, is this recent? Or, you know, sometimes these things... I notice it's something with a college Jeopardy version. Yeah. It comes out every year. Someone posted and it becomes viral, and it's from something from like 2014. It's an Indiana know. student I'm assuming. that has a terrible answer, and they just regurgitate it every year. Uh, I'm guessing this is recent, but I feel like sometimes these things will fool you. Older, you know, being like the worst, like the worst guess that I can recall on Will of Fortune was when the the answer was Achilles, and someone said a a a kill of uh, Achilles or something Achilles, Achilles instead of Achilles. There's a, in my car, so my, my songs that I've purchased or own over the years, it always starts with, I know exactly what your song is too in your car, mm -hmm. it starts with the first one by song, it'll alphabetically, and mine is Achilles' Last Stand by Led Zeppelin. Okay. And every time it comes on, so I'll try to play like Kids Bop or Disney Hits <laughs> for my seven-year-old, and every time I plug my phone in, what plays is on the screen Achilles' Last Stand by Led Zeppelin. And every time my seven-year-old is asking so many questions about what is that word? Who is that again? Who is this Achilles? And I'm like, you know, Achilles was a warrior that he got hit <laughs> in the back of the foot. And that's how we call it the Achilles tendon. Achilles is uh, also known but Brad she's, Pitt. But what does Last Stand mean? I mean, I, it is just a, a historical tutorial that I'm having to give my seven-year-old every time that song Pops on. I'm thinking about downloading a new song that starts before that alphabetically, just so I don't have to answer questions about Achilles anymore when the song pops on. Well, you, you have to be strategic. You just need to get ahead of the AC, right? Because it's downloading. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's, yeah, it's I, playing I need, the first I need, uh, alphabetical song. So, what, what could you come up with other than? I'm sure there are better versions yeah, for your kids. Like, is, there what, a, is there a song the that starts is, with Aardvark? Can I get like a kid song that starts with but Aardvark? Doesn't the trick come down to what you're not going to be grilled over? Not necessarily that it's better. Yeah, it's and it's not like a, a you know dirty song or anything. Right. It's just every time, uh, Dad, who is Achilles again? And what is this last stand <laughs> that they're talking about with Achilles' last stand in this Led Zeppelin song? So I got to find something different. Yeah, we may be seeing the last stand of uh, Major League Baseball and Regional Sports Network. So when Fox Sports sold the Regional Sports Network to Sinclair, Sinclair it was like a $10 billion deal. And this is recent. Yeah. $10 billion sale. And they're now pointing to, you know, it's got to go away because it's not profitable at all. And the on top of all of that, you know, they, they had the pandemic that they went through, sports playing, not playing, all that. And now it's come time to look at the numbers and the cord cutters. If you weren't doing it five years ago, you're doing it now. And it's becoming more and more difficult for the regional networks to turn the same audience for their advertisers that we were used to seeing. They're still making, I mean, individually, like everyone... Here in this region, you're tuned in to either the Braves, the Reds, or Cardinals. the Cardinals, really. But that's not the case in across the country, where you've got three, regionally, three teams around you to pull from, like we do here in Middle Tennessee. And if you're a fan of a team, you're going keep to up, keep up with them no matter what. But it's got to become easier for the common fan to not get blacked out if you are subscribed to MLB TV instead of actually having the regional sports network. I think it's wild that um, with some of these deals, they can just like hand it back to the league. <laughs> Essentially, yeah. I, we know we signed this the contract, but whatever. the thing is that we're losing a ton of money and we can't sell this anymore because so much advertising money is going to digital or streaming. 
and we can't sell the same ad space on regional sports networks. So here, Major League Baseball, just take it back and do whatever you want to with yeah. it, and baseball just has to take it back because at some point it's just not financially sustainable. I really think all of this points to you know something we talked about earlier with Apple TV and their streaming and what they're doing with MLS, which – Great reviews on the first weekend of MLS having or, or Apple TV having all the MLS games on one streaming service. Their coverage was really good over one weekend. It's going to eventually go to an Apple or someone. This this two game a week Friday night package on Major League Baseball, I think, is going to be gobbled up into ten to twelve teams that have a failing regional sports network attached to them. Will go to an Apple, and you have to pay. $100 for the season or whatever they charge if you're a Braves fan or a Cardinals fan or a Diamondbacks fan or whatever the team is, you go and get that via streaming and you get every game that way. I, I, I really believe that's where we're probably headed. But Hutton, even that doesn't seem long-term sustainable for profit for Apple. I just bring up Apple because they're so rich yeah, and they can afford the huge losses for a while to go and gobble up these packages and spend money on it that way. But it's is it going to be profitable long-term? I don't know. Well, and you also have Warner Brothers, who's also – they've recently told all these leagues that they're stepping out of the regional sports network idea and model uh, based on where the company sees revenue coming in versus not. Uh, their company's TV networks, they've got Discovery, TNT, TBS, CNN, TLC, Eurosport. They fell 6% to around $5.5 billion as a part of their overall fourth quarter revenue, uh, which they reported was $11 billion, uh, as part of this entire cluster. But this is not just like baseball. This is all of it. Basketball, the whole thing. Um, but you NBA, know, you, you NHL, MLB. Sports, all of it, yeah. That's, that's so, who again, this affects the most. That's, that's, but I wonder, like, so do you think we see something where you have like Warner Brothers who then pulls everything together, then they create their own little sports app with all these properties they own, much like we've seen with Paramount Plus for CBS, right? It's like, going to take a company that big or bigger. That's why I keep pointing to Apple. Apple could do it. I mean, what Apple is doing, this is the great experiment with MLS. But, the MLS's growth is Apple TV's growth because they have no catalog to pull from. It's all about what they bring to the table. So what if they could strike a deal with Major League Baseball to carry every team and charge, depending on the team, a certain amount of money to see every game, to be an Apple TV Plus member. Would that make money for them? Yeah, yeah. Maybe. But, but also, it's just gonna cost Turner and Warner, and, I mean, they've got the contracts already to do it. If you wanted to do that way, yeah. if you could turn it around and then sell the leagues on it. But even Turner's looking at this going, man, we saw a massive decrease in viewership for the All-Star game and everything involved. Headlines next, including... The Padres payroll. College football's in trouble. There's a lot of people trying to keep it from happening. I think it's a general consensus across the college football landscape. We want to play football. College football is a huge part of the fall. It's a huge part of Americana itself. It just really felt like people in the country needed college football to just feel a little sense of normal. Well, big news from the Big Ten as the conference releasing its 10-game football schedule. We go home thinking that we're going to be practicing the next day. Everybody gets a text, stay home, everything's canceled. Big Ten fall football season has been canceled. We just believe collectively there's too much uncertainty. I guess what I'm trying to understand, though, Kevin, is that was the same position you had six days ago. The Big Ten is an unmitigated disaster. There was a ton of confusion. There was presidents saying one thing. There was coaches saying another. Players had to be silent. Coaches had to be silent. ADs had to be silent. People said, how does what you just did make any sense? And nobody really knew what the heck happened when they voted to cancel the season. You make this huge historical announcement, and then Kevin Warren never does a press conference to explain it. It was like a masterclass on how not to handle a crisis. The word really that was lacking in all of this is transparency. It felt like a lot of stuff was happening behind closed doors. Even today, we still don't know what occurred. So you don't tell us parents, that's fine, but you're not telling the young men that it affects. 
we have to make a decision to save the season. What about the history books? What about the rivalry games? What about Paul Bunyan's axe? How is that not going to go to a team this year? This is a failure of epic magnitude. The Big Ten presidents and leaders should be held accountable for the disastrous decisions that they're making. Then the commissioner doubles down, saying his decision will not be revisited. And that's the point it felt like a war was declared on the Big Ten and Kevin Warren. Play, play. Everything turns political. Because if this is medical, play, play. then you would have stopped the game of football play, play. a long time ago. Play, play. I think the Big Ten leaders will tell you that they probably made a mistake in hindsight. If I had the chance to do it all over last year, um, I would I would do uh, make the same decisions that we made. Just like that, final hours here on this Monday edition. Glad you're with us, recapping the top sports storylines. Almost made it, Hudden. One more hour. One more hour. One more hour. The Monday is body, done. Our location with Yeehaw Beer and Old Smoky Moonshine. We're going to get up, uh, get into the Major League Baseball and the payroll for the Padres and the money they're dishing out, even to players that were already making bukus of money and major contracts with the franchise either way. Money's to be made at the the top crust of name image likeness, Jab. But late last week we saw where the NCAA is handing down their first ever NIL infraction. Uh, and it happened at Miami. And here's how they're going. I think this is a blueprint for how they're going to try to go about this moving forward. And they're couple of key factors of who they didn't discipline in this. But in April of last year, 2022, um, you had the two women's basketball players, the Cav Cavender twins, the Cavender twins. They left Fresno state for Miami and they're Did a huge social media. Fall. Yes. Massive. Uh, top of the game in terms of NIL. And at the time, they were telling front office sports, but I went back in my notes, we discussed this, that it wasn't because of NIL as to why they went. But keep in mind, John Ruiz, who was at the forefront of NIL at Miami, uh, a big booster, he was put in touch with them through the Miami head coach, Katie Meyer. So the NCAA, they have not penalized the Twins. They have not penalized John Ruiz. They have penalized Katie Meyer, who's been punished by for facilitating the meeting between the booster and Which the Which was twins. a dinner at his house. Um, the NCAA and they confirmed that by Sports Illustrated, who it confirmed it was Ruiz. And Ruiz met, met them earlier than he should have 
and provided a recruiting inducement, a free dinner, is basically what this was. The punishments, though, slap on the wrist for the most part. You, you have the program that's on probation for a year, and they were fined. I don't know the details of the actual fine. And the head coach, Meyer, was also suspended for three games. But you can now have your head coach endorse the collective on campus, but your coach, your program, someone at the university cannot then also set up the meeting with the booster, the one individual. You can do that with the collective, but not the individual. And that's what they were doing here based on how well-known these twins are in terms of their name image likeness. And I, I think this is how they're going. This is how they're ensuring that they're not going to be in front of the Supreme Court. They didn't go after the players. They're not stopping them, and they're not going after Ruiz. They're going after the individual university in the program. Let me give a little twilight zone for you here. What if the booster is the collective? Well, isn't that shocking? Well, it's he is the collective. But they're not he going after him. He is the single entity, but they're saying, you know, you can't meet with a booster, but you can meet with a collective. Well, what if John Ruiz, he is the collective no, you, you, for Miami you Athletics? You can meet with whoever you wish as the individual athlete. You cannot, as a coach, specifically set them up as part of a recruiting deal in order to get it done. She facilitated that. The, the coach facilitated said meeting. But they can with a collective, but they can't with a booster. The coach can endorse the collective. They can't. I don't think you can actually just set them but up. But my my argument is and this: is with John Ruiz, he was on a on a tear. Yeah. On Twitter over the weekend, saying, "Please try to disassociate me because you will be sued so fast if that's the case." And I, I love this guy for yeah. that reason. With the NCAA. No, I'm with you Richard. again. I'm, it is the John. He is. It's it's his collective. So he is both booster and collective. And here's a little uh, update for everyone out there. Every single collective are boosters. These are all people with vested interest in athletics succeeding at that school. These are not really that independent of bodies. You mm -hmm. know, they're all associated as alumni, as fans, well, as business interests within the cities, whatever, as boosters. So where does one end and the other begin? And if I'm John Ruiz, my argument to the NCAA is – yeah, I'm a booster. I also run the collective for Miami, so try and stop me. Well, they, they can't stop him, but what they've done is they've circumvented their own policy or lack thereof. Uh, and, and look, I, I don't blame them for being scared of being sued here, but what they've done is legally, uh, according to you know, the, the legal analysts that are breaking this down, CBSSports.com has uh, the story. Front Office Sports is where I'm reading this from, but they're citing CBS. Um, the punishment from the NCAA came about as a negotiation between the NCAA and the university. So it's more or less arbitration where the university signed off on the punishment. Therefore, it takes away the ability for them to then sue the NCAA for a punishment they agreed to. Well, and the NCAA also gets to come back after the fact in their statement or their findings with it and say, we wish he was disassociated from the university. And that's what fired up John Ruiz. You know, our advice would be to disassociate. And he said, yeah, that's not going to happen. And here's why. And, and I'm, I'm with Ruiz on this. Look, the NCAA just has so little power now with all of this that I completely agree with the NCAA or anyone else who is arguing, hey, we need some controls over some this. Some guidelines, something, some yeah. Some guidance, some rules. You know, it can't just be totally the wild, wild west. There are rules in professional sports, even though the athletes get paid a lot of money, for a reason, for a competitive balance, for control, so you don't get something that's completely out of whack. And it is out of whack right now, and in part because John Ruiz knows it's out of whack. He can operate in his own space and sort of do what he wants. I also think that it's just really trivial that we're concerned about this. Well, here's the And especially with the Cavender twins for this reason. This, this is what NIL is for. They come in with the followers. They come in with the status on social media, the ability to market products, uh, to market Life Wallet, which John Ruiz owns, which they're marketing on their social media platform. So I just feel like this is the wrong fight. Well, th yes. But see, the fight now 
comes down to this, and this is where it's going to be really interesting to follow. The NCAA, uh, back in January of this year, they put in a new bylaw that went into effect where they are now saying that they are taking news reports and social media posts that can constitute evidence for a violation in this. So if Sports Illustrated is putting out there in the new world of NIL last year that the Cavender twins met with Ruiz by way of Katie Meyer, the head coach, they can now look at that and then go to the university and hand down some type of punishment. That's, in effect, that's, you know, the, the Yahoo Sports angle of what we've always seen of them doing the digging. The report comes out, and that's the NCAA investigation for head coach violations, recruiting violations, or anything of the sort. So I'm just going to put two and two together here. Uh, Tony Vitello, Tennessee baseball coach, was suspended yeah. for three games. And it was announced that it was because of tampering allegations with uh, – every time I try to get, say this – Maui. Maui Ahuna is sounds his right. last name. That sounds right. Who's yeah. now, who can now play, right? Yeah, it sounds like one of the characters from, from Moana that my daughter <laughs> likes a lot. I think there's a Maui, and I think The Rock plays Maui in that. So every time I hear Maui, I think of The Rock's character in Moana. Um, so Maui Ohuna, there's some tampering allegations. I'm going to go ahead and guess it's something like this, right? That he had dinner with them or same arranged length, a dinner. Same length of suspension. With, uh, same length. You know, took it on the chin with a three-game suspension. Tennessee announces what happened. Oh, it was too early. Or, you know, they got him in touch with the maybe Spire or whatever. Or whoever. You know, yeah. some sort of NIL agent. And then this happened. And I just, I look at it and, and I think with this, this just isn't the most pressing concern to me with college athletics. No. Because if the guy wants to leave, right, which this guy clearly was going to leave Kansas after this last year and go somewhere, I mean, I think everyone's sort of in the same game. I, I don't know. If, if you're, in fact, following through on your NIL and, you know, what you're promising these kids and you don't have people promising something they can't deliver and it's on the up and up and they're also asked – to do different things for NIL, then I, I just don't have a big issue with it. Chad, Manny Machado. By the way, the, sta the statement from the coach oh, yeah. at, uh, at Miami was also great, where she basically said, yeah, I don't agree with this. I'm just doing this because I'm being told, and I'm of the yeah, utmost the, integrity. The university told her and no she one was knew, doing it. No one knew the r r rules, basically, no, is what you said. No, of course not. No, of course uh, not. The NCAA said everyone's on their own. Yeah. You know, so we're trying to figure all this out, and now, you know, it comes to find out. Here it is from Katie Meyer. For over 30 years, I have led my programs with integrity and have been a collaborative partner with the NCAA. Collegiate athletics is in transformation, and any inadvertent mistake I made was prior to a full understanding of implemented guardrails and the clarification issued by the NCAA in May. We all look forward to a time when there is a national solution to help our student athletes, coaches, and institutions. Let me translate. She's saying, I want to take this moment to apologize for absolutely bleeping nothing. That's what I want to do right now. That is Katie Myers' response to the NCAA in a three-game suspension. And honestly, bravo. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. No issues and, with that. But, None. And it's still just a slap on the wrist, but they're pointing to, oh, this is the first ever infraction, suspension, and penalty for NIL. You know who else loves this statement? Jay Billis, because he hates everything with the NCAA. <laughs> and it can never be. No, no 18 to 22-year-old has ever been at fault if they play college sports for anything, any crime, any misbehavior yeah, ever. They're always right, 100% of the time. That is the Jay Billis stance. Chad, the, the payroll discrepancy in Major League Baseball is out. It's been out of whack, but this year, if you look at the – $80 million payroll for one franchise, and then you see the Mets and now the Padres, insanity. You have the haves and the have-nots. And in order to make the game not just more competitive, but just more interesting top to bottom with stars everywhere, Manny Machado, he was already under contract. He's agreed to an extension with the Padres. It's the largest ever for a third baseman in terms of total value, fourth largest for any position. Uh, he's now fourth highest paid behind Trout, Betts, and Aaron Judge. He's got now an 11-year, $350 million extension. He had already been under a 10-year, $300 million contract. But now he's in San Diego to finish his career. 
He's 30 years old. He finished second in the M MVP voting last year for the National League. But, Chad, the payroll for Fernando Tatis, Xander Bogarts, you Darvish, Joe Musgrove, I mean, adding up the money they're going to owe these guys, it is well over $600 million. And now you add on top of that Machado and what they're doing. The Padres of all franchises at the top of the list. And they continue. They bought in at the trade deadline last year, and they continue to put more money behind their star players. You have two different leagues, NFL and Major League Baseball. Ooh. One league is designed for everyone. It was 8-8, eight and eight, but now they have 17 games, so the math is off. But everyone to go 8-9 and nine or 9-8 nine and eight, based on the rules of the league and the salary cap and the way the draft works and the way everything's implemented. It is designed for everyone, if you were doing a decent job, to go 8-9 and nine or 9-8. Nine and eight. Here you have another league in Major League Baseball that is actually designed right now based on ownership money and the way money is allocated to where seven or eight teams are designed to win 100-plus games a year, and literally every other team in the league is designed to suck. That is yeah. not good for interest in your sport. It is great if you're a Mets fan. It is great if you're a Yankees fan. It is great if you're a Dodgers fan. It is great now if you're a Padres fan. There are select teams that spend at the highest levels that you love your summers. But if you're the Pittsburgh Pirates or the Baltimore Orioles, who, by the way, Hutton are off to a great start this spring. I'm getting a little bit optimistic oh, about your O's. Where they, uh, they're starting when they finish. Or the Kansas City Royals. I mean, with the exception of building a great farm system and having a young team that comes of age early and being able to go on a nice yeah. run before you have to lose those guys in free agency. Or, or, or they're traded. Or trade them away. It's a tough sport. I mean, look, I'm a Braves fan, and I've had a, I, they won the World Series a couple of years ago, and they were competitive into the playoffs this year. It's fun. It's fun being a Braves fan right now. They're not the very top of the league in spending, and eventually, even though they've got young guys under team control for a while, it's not going to be any fun to be a Braves fan because there's going to be six other teams spending about 150 <laughs> mil more than they are. And you're going to go into a weekend series of those teams and say, well, they got swept again. Why? I don't know, because they have all the good players on this team. That's why they keep losing. It's not fun. This is not a sustainable model for your league if you're baseball. The NFL it's is a sustainable model. It's out of whack. That is the sustainable model well, in pro and sports. There, there, and you have the ownership that is spending versus the ownership that's not that can't come to terms on where the middle ground is because one's willing to spend a, more than just the middle ground for those that are on the cheap. If you had... Uh, 23 more Steve Cohens oh. own Major League Baseball teams. Oh. If you had a child that is a good athlete, how in the world would you not get them they to play to baseball? They need to start riding left-handed before they I mean, I'm just looking at it thinking, uh, you know, the, the, the possibility of serious debilitating injury is lower yeah. than a lot of other sports, right? I mean, all of the – Guaranteed then financial. You just have blank checks being written by these owners, that super billionaire type guys who yeah. don't even care – if they're losing money as long as they can win, what a sport. I what know. a time to be a great baseball player if you're coming up to the ranks right now and you're seeing what some of these teams are spending. Chris Trapasso is about to join us. He's the CBS Sports draft analyst. He is at the NFL Combine or headed there, I believe. And we'll preview tomorrow's start in Indianapolis. We'll get the top headlines from Chris and much more. Straight ahead on Outkick 360. Guys, let's move on to probably the thing more people are talking about, unfortunately, uh, for baseball than anything, which are the new rule changes. Uh, I'm going to start off by saying I think they all suck uh, and are horrible. Uh, so uh, I'm coming from that angle. Um, and, and I know that, again, sounds like the uh, old man get off my lawn theory, but the game, uh, baseball was the only game, uh, really the only game without a, a clock. The only game left without a clock, and now that that, that is changing, I'm, I'm not happy about that. But we'll talk about, uh, start off with the, the kind of the inconsequential ones, a bigger base. You know, here's the only complaint I have about that. A over 100 years ago when baseball was invented, uh, it was mathematically perfect. The diamond was mathematically perfect. 90 feet between bases, 60 feet 6 inches from the mound to the plate, and I think 135 feet from home plate to second base. All of those things 
created the statistical uh, uh, Hall of Fames that we have. Um, you take six inches away from the mound, you're going to have drastically different batting averages and career batting averages. You change the the, the base pass, uh, shorten or lengthen, you're going to have a dramatic impact. Uh, the base being a little bit bigger, I don't think is going to do absolutely anything for player safety. I think it's just going to look stupid. Uh, it'll give advertisers a bigger face uh, on the bases, which you know is going to happen. Um, if they wanted to truly take care of player safety, they, they would have done what softball did, put an alternate bag on the outside of the baseline and have the runner run to that instead of running to the same bag. So I, I think that's kind of a dumb one, and I don't think it's going to have much to do. Um, the pitch clock. Uh, so as a pitcher, I can tell you this. The only pitchers in professional baseball that will be affected by the pitch clock are pitchers that suck. Period. It, it, it's 20 seconds, I think, between uh, return of the ball and the next pitch with nobody on. I think it's 30 seconds with runners on or whatever. That should never, ever come into play. A good pitcher gets rid of the ball, in my opinion, uh, 8 to 10 to 12 seconds after he gets it back. There's no – and the only thing that delays that is the batter stepping out of the box, which can no longer happen, which you're going to see some guys are going to have a lot of problems with that. You watch spring training, if nothing else, for that. Um, but the pitch clock is not going to be something that's going to impact anybody that's any good because uh, good pitcher. Well, I mean, one of the etiquettes of being a good pitcher is you get the ball back and you and you throw because you keep your defense on their toes. Uh, you keep everybody in the game. And when you're in the dog days of summer and you're out, uh, used to be uh, not as much anymore. But I, I can remember being on uh, St. Louis's artificial turf and it was 165 degrees uh, for the everyday players. And getting your, your team off the field quickly in a hot summer day is a good thing. Plus, again, you're going to find that pitchers that work faster will give up fewer unearned runs and will have better defensive metrics behind them uh, as a whole. Um, so the pitch clock, eh, whatever. Um, the runner at second base is stupid now as it was then. Just stupid, stupid, stupid. Uh, don't get it. Don't understand. I know what they're trying to do, but I just think it's dumb and it takes away. Uh, plus, it's also going to change statistics. You're going to get an RBI. Pitcher's not going to have to give up an earned run. It's going to be a busy week of reporting from Indianapolis. Everyone's in a great mood as far as franchises are concerned. Coaches don't feel the pressure. GMs are building or rebuilding, but they're solidified in the direction they're going. Really, the nervous guys are the scouts because they clean house with the scouting department That's right. after the draft. But in terms of quarterbacks, both in the draft and free agency and the agents that are on the scene in Indianapolis and all of that, We'll start to stack some info as we head towards April and really March 15th. 
Chris Trapasso joins us, CBS Sports NFL Draft Analyst. Chris, it's going to be busy. What's the top headline right now in Indianapolis as we begin what's going to be the craziness for NFL Draft 2023? It's all about Florida quarterback Anthony Richardson and the fact that he came out today and said that he is going to work out, he's going to throw, he's going to go through the entire gamut of all the on-field drills. Meanwhile, Bryce Young from Alabama is not going to do anything. And I think that raised a little bit of a red flag where Bryce Young maybe didn't feel like he had the same level of athleticism or arm strength as Anthony Richardson from in there inside the SEC. Will Levis is going to throw too. He's going to do some workouts. So early on, and a lot of people are just arriving today, it's all about these top four quarterbacks and the fact that we are going to see three of the top four work out, but Bryce Young notably not going to work out here in Indy. Chris, how legit are the thoughts of Richardson or Levis going ahead of Young or C.J. Stroud at this point? Right now, I don't think they feel very strong, but how I view it, and I kind of double-checked this with a few scouts that I know, they think that after the Combine, we will start to get more momentum for either of those two quarterbacks to potentially be that quarterback that a team trades up with the Bears at the number one pick and and ultimately is the top pick in the draft just because they're both very physical, very athletic quarterbacks. We're going to see their cannon arms that they have in the throwing session. And for as great as Bryce Young is, for as poised as he is beyond his years, anticipation throws all over his film, he's probably going to be 5'10", 5'11", and might get to 200 pounds. Meanwhile, Will Levis and Anthony Richardson look the part, and they have that, at least in the realm of Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen and Justin Herbert-type arm strength and athleticism. To to me, C.J. Stroud is sort of the ultimate uh, tweener between the two worlds we're talking about here. Bryce Young, obviously super productive. To me, he's the best player in this draft, best quarterback in this draft, versus the potential physically between Will Levis and Anthony Richardson. Here's a guy who's good size, who did it at a high level, right? And doesn't have a ton of question marks around him. Chris, how do you view him in relation to those other three quarterbacks we discussed? Well, that's interesting that you said that because he's my number one quarterback in this draft class. I have him graded just ahead of Bryce Young. I think he gives you a little bit more arm talent and arm strength than Bryce Young. And I think he's a little bit more polished, just strictly inside the pocket. He does not come close to Bryce Young, ad-libbing, creating, evading uh, pass rushers inside the pocket. I mean, we got a little glimpse of what C.J. Stroud can do in that uh, college football playoff game against Georgia. And that being the final game that scouts saw and people like me saw certainly kind of tipped the arrow upward for him during this pre-draft process. You're absolutely right. He's He's right in the middle. He's kind of like Bryce Young in some ways and a little bit like Will Levis and Anthony Richardson. But that's what, again, is so good about the combine is that we get in this draft three of those quarterbacks on the same field. We can look at their their velocity on their fastballs and see them working out and to ultimately see how they compare athletically, which has become really important at the quarterback position in today's NFL. Chris Trapasso joins us, CBS Sports NFL Draft Analyst from Indianapolis on the eve of the start of the NFL Combine. Chris, so the the Bears are in a great spot. They've got $100 million worth of cap space right now. They have a a quarterback still under his rookie contract, and they're going to get a haul for that number one overall pick because if you're a team not Houston or Indy, you want to get ahead of that group so that you get your guy. And you've got to get ahead of Houston at number two. What do you think the hall could be for, for Chicago? And is it more is it more about how great Levis and Richardson end up being in the minds of not one, but many? Because then you kind of stack the group different if you're looking for that top tier. Yeah, that's a great question. I think to just add more competition at the top of this quarterback class, like I mentioned, I think we're going to see that after this combine that we all know that Anthony Richardson is a little bit raw, but again, when he is 6'3", 225 pounds, runs in the four fives, has a vertical in the upper thirties, people are going to just be so tantalized by what he could become. You throw him into the mix with the high floor of Bryce Young. I think there will be multiple bidders calling the Chicago bears. Like you mentioned, 
trying to get ahead of the Houston Texans. They're going to get multiple first round picks and probably a few day two selections in the upcoming drafts. What will ultimately be the question that the bears need to answer is do they want to move back to four where they could probably still get one of Jalen Carter or Will Anderson, or do they want to just diversify all the, the draft capital that they could get and hopefully maybe move back to number nine with the Carolina Panthers, a team that has kind of waited in the waters of the veteran free uh, uh, quarterback market of late and certainly was not successful. If they do that, they're going to miss out on those marquee defensive prospects at the top from the SEC, but they're going to get probably two or maybe even three first round picks that could really help them as they're just at this ground floor of the rebuilding process. Chris, looking through your big board right now uh, of top prospects at CBSSports.com, and I was surprised. We're based out of Nashville, Tennessee here. I was surprised to see number 11 and the first offensive tackle on your list is Darnell Wright uh, from Tennessee. This is way higher than I've seen him anywhere else. What is it about Darnell Wright that, that appeals to you? Well, he really brings everything that I look for in an offensive tackle that I think we're here at the Combine. We're going to be talking about certainly even offensive linemen that, that run fast, that have good verticals. But what I've noticed in my years of scouting is that you need to be big and powerful once you get to the NFL. And it usually takes even the marquee talents at the position every year, at least a, a season or two to get what I call NFL strong. You just can't really mimic the power, even in the SEC that you're going to see in the NFL. At 6'5 and 340 plus pounds, Darnell Wright is about as close to being NFL strong as I've seen at the offensive tackle position. Would probably go back to Tristan Wirfs, who really hit the ground running out of Iowa with the Buccaneers in the 2020 draft. Um, and then beyond that, he is so advanced and nuanced as a pass protector. Even at right tackle, resetting his hands, swatting down the arms of edge rushers that he faced. And he faced a lot of good ones in the SEC, I thought he gave Will Anderson as good of a battle as any offensive lineman gave Will Anderson in his three seasons at Alabama. He's not an amazing run blocker, but at 6'5", 340, and you know he can come in and be very advanced as a pass protector, that to me screams middle of the first round talent. I hope he runs well, tests well to kind of check that final box. But in terms of just the film, Darnell Wright checked every box for me. Chris, where is the buzz lacking at the wide receiver position at the top of this draft? It, I've seen guys in mocks put the wide receivers all over the place in the first mm -hmm. round. Where does the value really land right now with the three or four top guys? I think it's later in round one, like the last few selections, those teams that were went deep into the playoffs but could certainly use some more um, reinforcement at the receiver spot. We're not getting that normal buzz because first off, I think everyone understands there's not a Jamar Chase. There's not a Jalen Waddle. There's not that type of marquee top five to top seven overall selection at, at the position. And the consensus top receiver right now, Quentin Johnston, is coming from a wide open kind of air raid system where he didn't run a lot of routes. And it's going to take him some time to learn the route tree kind of on the fly at the NFL level. He's big. He's fast. He creates after the catch. But the more nuanced players at the position, Jordan Addison, Zay Flowers, um, Jackson Smith and the Jigba from Ohio State, they're all a little bit smaller. So with those Jamar Chase types, you had the size, you had the route tree, you had the yards after the catch ability. We don't really have that at the top of this wide receiver class. But we've seen in the past with the likes of A.J. Brown and Debo Samuel, D.K. Metcalf in 2019, Terry McLaurin in that same draft class in the third round, you can still get like wide receiver ones on day two of the draft. That's what this draft class feels more like as opposed to what we've seen recently with the, you know, those big time top 10 overall picks at the receiver spot. And this running back class has a lot of depth. Is there a big drop off from Bijan Robinson at Texas to, to number two on the list? Or do you see not as much separation between him and everyone else that, that if you look at any top 10 running backs, uh, when you look at this, it, it, there's some good quality there. Yeah, it, it is really deep at the running back spot. And I, I don't think there's that big of a gap between B. Jan Robinson and, say, Jameer Gibbs from Alabama, Devin A. Chain from Texas A&M. Those are two just speedsters at the running back position. I love everything about B. Jan Robinson. 
He feels very similar to Saquon Barkley to me, but he's not quite as fast as Saquon Barkley was. I mean, Saquon Barkley ran 4-4 flat at 230 pounds at the 2018 combine. I, I don't think B. Jan Robinson is that fast. And I think in today's NFL, beyond the whole idea that teams realize maybe it's not the smartest allocation of a draft pick to pick a running back in the first round, teams are really prioritizing. And I've talked to a lot of scouts about this just straight line speed at the position where if things are blocked right and you can hit a 60 or 70 yard touchdown, but you're not going to get the ball and be great 20, 25 times a game, teams are okay with that. And I think with Gibbs, with a chain, even with Israel, Abanacanda from Pittsburgh, um, tank Bigsby from Auburn, those guys can hit those home runs. So I certainly think if there's a running back who goes in the first round, it will be Bijan Robinson but we'll ultimately look back at the likes of Gibbs and a chain and say, those were better value selections at the running back spot. Chris, you, you, we mentioned Anthony Richardson, Will Levis. They have a lot to gain. They're working out. They're throwing uh, in full. Give us a quarterback that's on day two that has the most to gain this week in Indianapolis. Well, had he not torn his ACL, I would have gone with Hendon hooker because I, I liked his athleticism and his ability to, um, create outside of the pocket and just how many bucket throws that he dropped to Jalen Hyatt and Cedric Tillman last season. Um, I'll go with Jaron Hall from BYU. He's probably actually more of a day three guy. Um, he's a little bit of an older prospect. And I think certainly coming from that BYU program that spit out Zach Wilson, who's ultimately flamed out in two seasons with the Jets, doesn't necessarily help him. But you watch the Jaron Hall film over the last two years, and I think his creativity, his athleticism will sneak up on some people. If he tests very well, runs one of the faster 40s, has you know a good vertical, a good broad jump, throws it well, because I think he's got a pretty live arm, he could be someone that could sneak into the back end of the second day of the draft and start his career as a backup, who could maybe even come in early in his career in that spot starting role and win a game or two for an NFL team. What do you believe Hyatt needs to run to be a first round pick? I think if he runs anywhere close to four, four flat high four threes, which I think certainly is doable at his size. Um, he just has the perfect size uh, or height and weight combination that he's going to be right around six foot 180 pounds. That's what yeah. we've seen with John Ross, Henry Ruggs last year. Uh, Kalen Barnes, the cornerback from Baylor ran in the four twos right around that size. If he runs, and shows 4-3 something, which I think he will, I think he'll lock himself in the first round. He doesn't have the super well-rounded skill set, but again, speed is a priority for teams today. Just your ability to hit those splash plays, and certainly as we saw this past season with Jalen Hyatt, he can do that. I almost feel like Will Anderson is kind of a forgotten guy in this because of all the talk about what the Bears are going to do trading back and yeah. all the talk about quarterback. I look at Jalen Carter. That's just another, you know, super successful guy that's won back-to-back -back national championships. Uh, there's so many Bama and Georgia guys every year now that we're talking about in the draft that sometimes the top guys, in a weird way, get lost in the shuffle. Uh, what do you think about those two and about my theory that you produce so many NFL players and it's easy to forget some of them at times, which is a compliment to both programs? Yeah, definitely. I mean, those are the two marquee programs in college football today, not just winning national titles, competing, but just spitting out first round picks, multiple guys uh, early in the draft every year. I think you're right, though, that they are probably going to go into at least the pro day circuit a little bit underrated because I, I would be surprised if either of them do a lot working out. I think Will Anderson said today he's not going to work out. We haven't gotten any word on Jalen Carter yet but they don't need to work out. They don't need to prove anything. Anthony Richardson is trying to show everyone how fast he is because he's a little bit raw on the field. Jalen Carter and Will Anderson looked like future first round picks the second they stepped foot into the SEC. So there's certainly be a lot of Georgia and Alabama players that we're going to talk about. Brian Branch, Keely Ringo, Christopher Smith, the safety from Georgia, who's such a fun player. But yeah, Will Anderson and Jalen Carter, I, I think are locked in to the top five, but we won't hear that much about them because it's really just like that they're um, marquee talents that we've known for almost a year now that they're going to go that high in the draft. What is it about Tyree Wilson from Texas Tech that some have moved ahead of Anderson at the position? 
he is going to give more size and length than Will Anderson. I mean, there's not any concerns about Anderson's size. Um, he kind of looks like that modern day defensive end that doesn't have to be gigantic. But Tyree Wilson could be like 6'6 six, six or 6'7, 260 pounds with crazy long arms. He can bend, had a great season at Texas Tech, certainly does not have the multiple years of high level productivity that Will Anderson has. But any teams that prioritize length and size, maybe even more so than what they saw on the field. That's why I think we're starting to get some buzz for Tyree Wilson, um, maybe being right up there with Will Anderson in this draft class at the edge rusher spot. And if let's hypothetically say Chicago doesn't move out of number one, which defensive player do they select? I think it would be Jalen Carter okay. and, and that's not any inside info. It's just that I think it is harder in today's NFL to find a truly three down disruptive interior defensive lineman than it is to find an edge rusher. I think in this draft, it's loaded at the edge rusher position. And I would think that their GM, Ryan Poles, would realize, okay, we can find someone that's maybe 70 or 80% of Will Anderson, but the drop off between Jalen Carter and the number two edge rush or interior defensive lineman that can get up the field can be a, a 70 or 80 tackle guy and a 10 sack guy. It, it, there's just not that player in this draft. So I think because of that and the positional value and how scarce it is to find someone like Jalen Carter, who's really like a unicorn, I think they would go with Jalen Carter. Chris Trapasso has been our guest, CBS Sports NFL Draft Analyst. Uh, great work as always, man. We, we appreciate the, the visit today. Good luck all week uh, with all of the, the coverage that you'll be having at CBS. Yep, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, man. And uh, check him out on Twitter, at Chris Trapasso. Uh, great follow and uh, loads of information there on the NFL Draft, NFL Combine coverage. Uh, we'll have you there covered as well at OutKick. And I'm sure some of the coverage that we'll be uh, writing about will be through tweets from Chris, uh, as well as uh, Armando and others that will be on site this week. Looking forward, Really looking forward to chatting with Armando. Really good info from him in this uh, Tis the Season I, now for I NFL agree. Draft. I agree with him on it sounds crazy because i love will anderson but carter is probably better value given the fact that if you start naming off interior defensive linemen aaron donald uh jeffrey simmons chris jones and then you have to you know the really start to think yeah. about other guys yeah. that are huge difference makers yeah and i i i think carter's one of those guys yeah, he could, he could certainly be a difference maker in a spot that there are few and far between with that upper tier guy. Uh, that's a difference maker. I love Will Anderson though. Yeah. So it's, unless that's he's a matched up with one. Darnell Wright. Yeah, whoever that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> now, he may uh, look. I, that's the highest I've seen Darnell Wright. So I wanted to ask him about it. But yeah. he brought up some good points about him, and you know he was negated this year in that Tennessee win over Alabama by Darnell Wright. I'm talking about Will Anderson. Yeah. But back to back years, by the way, whoever that first defensive player drafted is, if the we think the Bears will trade out and the quarterback mm -hmm. will go one, it's going to be interesting to see who someone drafts with that that spot. Arizona at three could be the first one we see, or it could be Chicago if they trade back with Indianapolis. Hit us up with your thoughts. I'll kick 360. You can join us in the chat as well. You can chat with Chad uh, on YouTube. Just search out I'll kick 360. We we'll hope, you, hope you'll subscribe while you're there. Uh, coming up. There's a new Netflix and a Netflix series, an HBO series that's coming, and a trial that's ongoing that's captivated me. Chad's all on board as well from the weekend binge. Details next on Outkick 360. Welcome into Outkick the Show. I am Clay Travis, your fearless leader. I am going to continue to argue that sports is one of the great unifying forces in all of American life. ESPN is a sinking ship. Democrats are now the party of the white, woke college graduate. So the higher that number can be, the better you are with the committee. It's really that simple. You gotta lean into the turns. You really gotta lean into the turns. He's got incredible taste in, uh, <laughs> in which media figures he listens to. Very difficult to go back-to-back -back years in the NFL with the number one overall pick. I've been out of LA long enough to have forgotten that libs, no matter how ridiculous the scenario, are gonna live. 
Another week of inflation, another week with Biden with COVID, and another set of losers to crown. People don't watch the WNBA on TV, in person, on a plane, on a train, on a bus, or on purpose. And the scary thing, Tommy, is in the history of this government, I've never seen them give anything back that they've taken. Oh, no, they never do. And they won't. Why are we going through Melania's goods? Don't make Brittany Griner out to be some type freedom fighter. Shouldn't there be a little bit of common sense? Let's roll them, big boy. What do you got? They want to find someone to be the face of domestic terrorism, and they want it to be a right-wing Trump supporter. Don't let them entrap you into doing something dumb. But they were hyper-rational. They looked at the data, and they said it makes no sense for me to submit to this COVID shot mandate. Get the yep. shot or you can't go to your brother's wedding. Get the shot or you can't go to your daughter's graduation. Get the shot or else.
Outkick 360 rolls uh, on. Sixth and Peabody are location funny. with Yeehaw Beer and Old Smoky Moonshine. Uh, Chad, you've been captivated by this trial that I've been watching. It's ongoing. The defense actually rested today, officially. But the, the documentary, documentary, the three-part, I believe, docuseries is out on there's, Netflix. There's two. So Netflix has a three-part docuseries. Right. HBO has a three-part docuseries. Okay. The HBO one's called Low Country. And then the Netflix one's called The Murdaw Murders. I have a hard time saying Murdog the way they pronounce it. Cause I, it's like the, Murdaw, like you it said. It should though. be Murdaw, but they mispronounce. The family mispronounces their own name. Yeah. Alex, it's A-L-E-X, and he tells everyone his name is Alec. That's and what thinking, everyone calls That's him. not what that is. But like, they, I, it's just the low country of South Carolina. This, it's a five-county uh, jurisdiction for the chief solicitor. And the Murdoch family has held power until he was ousted uh, for like 87 years, an 87 year run of his family running the low country of South Carolina, either from a judicial power or political power. And the everything in the background of their family storyline prior to him being charged with double murder of his wife and son is in pure insanity on top of the lies and the web that he spins, the addiction. Uh, he took the stand in his own defense, and uh, Creighton Waters is the lead prosecutor. I mean, it, for two days, he was on cross-examination, and they, they went at it. It was... I, I enjoy the live trial scenario. I like seeing how they phrase questions to get the answer that they want versus um, how the person on the stand will be trying to relay the information for on behalf of whichever side they're paid to be there for. Um, this is the details of this. I don't know how he's going to be found not guilty. I, I think at best there's a mistrial, but Chad, that what, what's your, what's the most fascinating detail for you in the background of the show so far? Well, just I'm a I'm a story guy, so it's the sto to me to sum it up. It's the story of extreme privilege where one family they're basically kings mm -hmm. of this small area. You know, this is when you have there's one of the doc I've seen so much over the weekend. One of the documentaries had a line that said, "The smaller the pond can produce, the bigger the fish." At times, and this is what you have in this area where the Murdoch family is, that's the biggest fish in this small little pond in Hampton, South Carolina. But extreme privilege and what extremes people will go to to hold on to it, yeah. I think is the biggest thing with me. That and the fact that I just I watch it, and the Netflix documentary docuseries does a great job in that first episode. It goes in the boating accident and what happens there. And I just... I can't even look at a member of the Murdoch family and not dislike them, right? Like yeah. you see the youngest son, Paul, and think, this is just a little, you know what, throughout, like the whole thing, the reaction to it and, and everything, it's, yeah, man, it's, it's tough to watch, you know, all the families involved and, you know, you've got the kids who are what, early twenties now, maybe 20 yeah. years old yeah. that were in high school when a lot of this was going on that are interviewed, interviewed on both the Netflix series and the HBO series. Um, it's a crazy, crazy story uh, of, again, like what you will do to cover up and or hold on to this power and this money and this corruption that and you it, are in control of. And it's about the last name because even after the double murders, which he's accused of and on trial for, uh, Alec Murdoch. By the way, the murder of his wife and youngest son. Youngest son, Paul, who was in the boating accident you're talking about that yeah. caused it. Um on top of that, after all that, that that took place in June, and in September, and he's admitted this in open court now, that he set up this hit on himself where he paid someone to drive by. He stopped on the side of the road. Paid his drug dealer. Yeah, but yeah, he paid his drug dealer. He he stopped on the side of the road, stabbed his tire with you know something, flat tire, and then paid someone to drive by and shoot him in the head. They were not accurate. Like, they grazed his skull. I mean, he, he had, you know, the x-rays to prove that he, he was attacked. He was trying to make it seem like the gunman came back for him. Or at least that's the accusation. But he has since admitted that he did that because he wanted his older son to inherit 
the Murdaugh legacy and the money and everything involved from the insurance that would be paid out. That's how bad off he was mentally, even after all of this. It is... Uh, and it's not just it's fascinating, so, and it's it's horrible at the same time. Well, the the you know the main thing is the the double homicide, double murder, that the the elder Murdaugh in this case, Alec, or it's spelled Alex, but Alec Murdaugh is accused of. But you have all of these side stories that they don't even spend a lot of time on. Oh, the docu series he, he stole the, over that, three million dollars. Well, that the housekeeper who mysteriously fell down some brick stairs yeah. a month and a half after he took out a $3 million insurance policy. Yep. If anyone were to die on his property that he collected on, um, there's the uh, the high school kid who's found dead in the street that was essentially a homicide but made to look like he got struck by a car. But in reality, there were bruises and probably but, was but in the relationship do, with him and Buster Murdaugh, the oldest son. But what they've that done, though, is the family crazy. with the political and judicial power they would then jump in and represent the families that they were trying to keep quiet. Yeah. And that's how they strung this out the way they did uh, with the, the law firm, which is since, again, they're, they're no longer that law firm. But It's like the he, only law firm in the five counties, it seems like. You have to go there yeah. to get a lawyer. Well, there's one, yes. There's one chief solicitor that was overseeing those five counties of the low country of South Carolina. And... It's just a, I mean, it, you feel like you're watching a movie that this, there's no way this could have played out the way it did. And I mean, he, he has a, he has a state Senator representing him as his attorney. Uh, that, that's the other thing about this representing Murdoch. Yeah. I, I, so I went into it and watched this docuseries. I just heard about the trial that everyone was talking about, not really following the news on it. So I went in completely blind yeah. and ignorant to anything. So Hutton, you had mentioned something about a, the kids in a boating accident yeah. that kind of kicked it off. Well, the first episode of the Netflix series kicks it off with that. But imagine my surprise when at the end of it, it's the 911 call where he's talking about his wife and kid being shot and killed. I had no idea. So I am watching this like it's a movie being played out before me because I didn't know any facts of the case well, and then, until seeing it. And then while he's on the stand, they catch him in a lie where he says he didn't see them after they left the house. And on the stand, he's admitted he has to admit he lied about the detail of going down to the dog kennels, which is where the murder took place, because they have that OnStar on his truck. Yeah. And it tells them exactly where he was, even though he didn't have the OnStar on mapping anything his whole thing where there's like this 12 minute window where he says he was somewhere else and he wasn't. And that's what it comes down to and whether or not the jury will believe him or that technology. Check it out on Netflix. It's worth the binge. We're back at it tomorrow, three o'clock Eastern outkick 360 right here across the outkick network.